Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the best Entitled People Stories we've read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled People you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that for every thumbs up this video gets, she won't try to get anyone fired for an entire week. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My stepsister is demanding to paint the room I'm letting her stay in. I, 25 male, own a pretty big house that I inherited from my grandparents. I'm currently letting my stepsister, Kana, who's 23, stay in one of my guest rooms for two months rent free. Everything has been going smooth until two days ago when Kana came in the house with cans of paint. I asked her what she was doing with those and she told me she was going to paint her room pink. I told her no because she's only staying here temporarily and I like the way the room is now. Kana said that she's currently staying in the room and she should have the right to be able to decorate the room however she wants to. I told her that even though she's staying in there, it's still my house and if she does paint the room, she will be kicked out. Kana got mad and called me names. My dad and stepmom think I was too harsh and I could have compromised with her. I feel like I have a right to not want the room painted. Am I the jerk? Edit. For the people saying that Kana is staying for more than two months, she isn't. Kana lives with my dad and her mom and they're getting their house renovated and are staying two hours away from me. And Kana's job is 10 minutes away from me, so it was easier for her to move in with me. Update. Someone posted the story on TikTok and a family member sent it to my stepsister. Kana got really mad and said to me that I was trying to turn the internet against her or something like that when I didn't use her real name and wrote this on a throwaway. Kana also said that she would get her things on Tuesday and is currently staying with my parents. I don't know how she's going to get from here to her job until October, but that isn't any of my business. My dad and stepmom have seen the video and the comments. Their opinions have changed, but they think I could have kept it off of Reddit. I don't think there's going to be any more updates for this because I don't know if anything is going to happen. A few people are asking why she didn't inherit anything from my grandparents. It's because she isn't related to them, and they were my mom's parents. Not the jerk. It's your house. She's staying there rent-free. Tell your dad and stepmom to take her in, and then she can paint their room pink. Or take their advice and compromise. Sure, she can paint the room pink, but she needs to pay two months rent and paint the room its original color before she leaves. No, 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 you don't compromise on this. You tell her no, she's not painting your house pink. Hey, relax, Karen. This is Reddit. You know some of these people are kind of, you know, out of their minds. Am I the jerk for not taking down a video that was a gift from my best man? I have a sister that's six years older than me. My parents for years have canceled on me last minute because of my sister. I have a basketball game. Sorry, OP. Your sister doesn't feel like going out. I'm graduating? Sorry, OP, your sister had a bad day at work. They've missed out on both major and smaller events in my life because of her meltdowns. I met the love of my life. We decided to tie the knot. From the beginning, I told my parents how I'm worried my sister will ruin another special moment in my life. My mom told me over and over again that it would not happen. The day of my wedding, I received a voicemail from my mom saying they couldn't come because my sister's dog was sick and she was upset. I was hurt. My best man, however, is a jokester. He took my phone, then went to my fiancé and asked if he could post a video of our wedding as a gift on social media. She loved his idea. I had no idea about it until I came home. Our honeymoon was at a lakeside cabin with no cell service. The post caption was, My best man. He is an amazing person, even if his parents never showed up for him. Video was still pictures of us next to her parents, me on the dance floor, cutting the cake, where you would normally see both parents in wedding pictures. The sound behind the video was my mom's voicemail explaining how they couldn't come because my sister's dog was sick. I came home a week later to hundreds of messages, family members from both sides insisting I take it down. I was told my sister hasn't stopped crying. My mom is refusing to leave the house. I may be the jerk here. I didn't take it down when I got my messages. I didn't call my family back right away. I waited until my vacation time was over at work and enjoyed my time with my wife in our new home before I contacted anyone.
my dad told me to take down the video. It was just a bad night for them, that they will make it up to me and my wife for not coming. My reply was, exactly how do you plan to make up my wedding? It's a once in a lifetime thing. You chose to ignore my feelings on the whole matter. Then he just repeated he will make it up to me. I told him I would take down the video only when he made up missing my wedding. Flustered, we both hung up the phone before we both said things that we shouldn't have. Am I the jerk here? I could have just taken down the video. Not the jerk. The truth hurts sometimes and your parents and sister just got whammied. Your friend is awesome. Please leave the video up. Exactly. Your friend didn't manipulate their words. Your parents would have nothing to cry about if they hadn't done anything wrong. They skipped your wedding with one seriously pathetic excuse. Let them feel the effects of that. Your friend is the true MVP in the story. OP, keep that video up until the end of time. Your parents need to be reminded just how much they failed you and favored your sister. Your family doesn't like it. Lucky for you, you just married into a new one. Not the jerk. Prove it? I'd love to. A while back, my agency was about to deploy a new financial management system, which had been developed in-house to dovetail with some of our pre-existing systems. I was part of a combo tech slash management group tasked with reviewing the new software. After a short hands-on demo, we were on the receiving end of a presentation by the developer, let's call him Tim, with whom I had a bit of not great history. And the more we got into the technical nuts and bolts of the FMS, the more apparent it was Tim was leaning heavily on security through obscurity, oddball data structures, deeply recursive API calls, etc. Mid-presentation, Tim and I got into it a little bit. Tim saying his structures were so arcane, nobody would be able to trace the course of his calls. Me calling BS, saying for a sufficiently skilled programmer, the question wouldn't be if, but when. Tim calling that BS, etc. You get the idea. After a few exchanges, an irated Tim said, You think it would be so easy to crack? Prove it. At that point, I backed off to let Tim finish his presentation. But while Tim did that, I cracked open my notebook and went back into the demo system. About 20 to 30 minutes later, when Tim was in the final Q&A phase of his presentation, I re-raised my concerns. Tim reasserted his confidence in his system security, at which point I asked, So you're saying you would have no qualms trusting this system to protect your personal data? And slid a piece of paper across the conference table to Tim. Tim looked at the paper, then back at me, then back to the paper again as his face turned beet red. This, of course, did not go unnoticed by the other attendees who looked curiously and those who actually knew me smirkingly at me. And not wanting to disappoint, I asked Tim if he wanted to share the contents of the note with everyone. A negative head shake was his only response. One of our other attendees who knew me said, Okay, what's the deal? We were a pretty informal bunch. But all I said was, it's Tim's call. Either he can read out loud what's on that piece of paper, or he can explain what it is and why he doesn't want to. Pointed into a corner, Tim had no choice. He mumbled, it's me. You see, while Tim was continuing his presentation, I had gone back into the demo, cracked my way down to programmer mode, and sussed through the data structures enough to get to the FMS personal file. I'd figured Tim was the sort to use himself as a test entry in the file, and I was right. His security through obscurity held out for less than half an hour. And on that piece of paper, nothing much, just Tim's social security number. Afterwards, the group decided some redesign was necessary before the system went into testing for production deployment, unanimously, including Tim. He moved on shortly after, by the way. Am I the jerk for siding with my mom over my wife and telling my wife it was her fault for putting me on the spot? My wife and I try to always side with each other in public, and if there is an issue, talk it out in private, so maybe I messed up here. My mom lives an 8-hour plane ride away, so if she's going to visit, it's going to be for at least 4 or 5 days to make it worth it. My mom is the one who moved, and my wife made it clear when she moved that she needs to be the one to come to us as she made the choice to move, doesn't have kids, and has the ability to work when she wants with no set schedule. My mom rolled her eyes but agreed. My mom also told me that we would not be altering our lives to revolve around my mom. While she is welcome to visit, we will not use up our limited vacation time which we would want to use to do things with our kids, and it isn't our job to entertain her. 
I felt weird about it, but agreed. My mom visited one time three years ago. We went to work as normal, and she was alone in the house during the day. By the time we got home, she was clearly bouncing off the walls and about to lose it. We did our normal chores and routine, though my wife did take over some of my duties so I could visit. We had our normal blah weeknight meals, and by the end of the trip, my mom was clearly miserable, overtired, and starving. She just didn't eat much, I don't know why. She didn't complain, but seemed upset. Then lockdown happened. Both of us were busy, and we just didn't see each other. We recently invited her to visit again, and my mom said sorry, but no. She said it was horrible, and if we can't put in the effort to host her, she isn't coming. I felt that was fair, as she didn't make any demands on us, just chose not to come. But my wife was very upset. My wife wanted to confront her about how entitled she was being. I refused, so she called my mom and accused her of being childish and needing constant entertainment. My mom and her got into it, with my mom yelling that we were bad hosts, and she was so bored, she actually cried one day. She said she doesn't owe us her time if we don't want to put in time for her, and she will never visit again unless something changes, but we have an open invitation to visit her. My wife asked if I was going to get involved. My mom said I need to get my wife to stop attacking her. My wife demanded to know whose side I was on, and I said my mom's. My mom began laughing. My wife teared up and hung up. Now she feels I betrayed her and that I'm a mama's boy. What? I haven't even seen her in three years. I told her it's her fault for putting me on the spot, and I just think my mom is entitled to the boundary of she doesn't want to visit. I mean, if you want to plan things and host your mom with activities and great meals, what is stopping you? It seems to me like your wife doesn't want to be expected to drop all her responsibilities to plan, prepare, and be the host, a role that women have been conditioned to take automatically. I would also guess that your wife may feel daunted by what hosting usually means for her. PTO, sure, but also planning activities, reservations, and meals, cleaning and setting up a guest room, cooking, grocery shopping, ensuring the kids have the right balance of grandparent time, educational time, downtime, etc. That's stressful. If you want your mom to come, have a conversation with your wife about how to ensure you can be welcoming and gracious hosts without overburdening your wife, aka you take on more of the responsibilities because it's your mom. Everyone sucks here. Your mom navigated airports and getting to you. Is she capable of renting a car? Using one of yours? Your mom was starving because she expected someone to shop and cook for her. She's acting super entitled and that her visit required everyone to drop what they were doing for her. Sounds like she's high maintenance and your wife had her number even before your mom moved away. I will say your wife saying that you couldn't take time off when your mom visited was wrong. Maybe you don't take a full week of paid time off, but a couple of days would have been okay. She also was foolish to call your mom and argue with her instead of just leaving it alone. You are the jerk because you denigrated your wife in front of your mother, plus not helping your mom have a better trip the first time around. We'll talk about all this later, or let's end this call and speak again another time or a zillion other non-committal answers were better than saying, I'm on my mom's side. I'd go to counseling with your wife if I were you. Both of you have stuff to apologize for, but your mother is the biggest jerk. She's driving a wedge in and she knows it and you fell for it. I agree. Mom sounds passive aggressive. No adult who's capable to travel alone by plane needs to starve or be bored. She can entertain herself. OP's wife should be thrilled she doesn't want to come. What's the problem? OP should visit his mom for a weekend if they want to spend time together. I don't get this mentality that you have to stay for days just because you have to travel for a few hours. In my country, we say that guests are like fish. They start to stink after approximately the same amount of time. You want neither of them hanging around for more than two to three days. Everyone sucks here. Not the jerk. First off, your mom is right. You are bad hosts. While it isn't your responsibility to entertain her 24-7, she still spent a lot of money and effort to visit, and y'all didn't plan or do anything special to spend time with her. That's not good. When my parents come to visit, I might not take off a full week, but we schedule things so I can take off two to three days and make their visit a really long weekend, Wednesday or Thursday through Friday, plus Saturday and Sunday. If they leave on Monday, that's four to five days spent together, and you're back to work on Monday. Also, I understand wanting to use your vacation time to do things with your kids, but why not just bring your mom to one of those things? 
If you're going to go on a trip to Disney, just have your mom fly down and meet you there and spend that time together. Or you can just take the kids and go visit your mom and give your wife a break. While everybody shares some culpability in how this mess was created, in my opinion, your wife bears the most responsibility because her entire attitude and response to your mom moving is unreasonable. She seemed to take her moving as a personal attack against her when in reality it's reasonable to assume that your mom didn't move to hurt your wife but did it for herself and for her own benefit. All of your wife's rules are just a passive aggressive way to punish your mom. This wasn't you taking your mom's side as much as it is siding with the most reasonable option available at the time. If your mom doesn't want to visit because she was miserable the last time, she shouldn't be forced to. Also, it's wild to me that in response to what your mom said about the last visit, instead of apologizing and finding a solution to make a future trip better, your wife doubles down and goes right to attacking your mom. Your wife, without a doubt, is the biggest jerk in this story. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife or his mom? Please let us know. This is exactly what I would do if you tried to get your mom to come visit us, Reddit boy. Why should I try to act like a decent human being and be nice to her? Am I the jerk for refusing to pay my share of an Airbnb until the buyer gives us a billing statement? I, in my 30s male, am going to an out-of-state bachelor party for a good friend's wedding. Everything was arranged by the best man who's a family member of the groom. I don't know him that well myself. First issue I and others in the group had was the best man booking a place without confirming the price and confirming if all of us could stay for three days. Several people in the group could only stay two and he insisted they pay full price. He opted to pick a relatively expensive location at 500 per person, 10 people total. I thought this was weird but decided to let it go and not say anything and go the full three nights. For the second issue, my spouse is going through medical treatment for an issue and her doctor said it was possible she'd need a procedure done the weekend of the trip. We have a toddler at home, so I'd need to cancel the trip if this happened, and would only get a few days notice if she needed it or not. I still really wanted to go, so I decided to buy travel insurance. I reached out to the best man and asked him to send me the Airbnb proof of purchase, since I'd need that to get reimbursed if I had to cancel. Even explain the reason I may not be able to go. He refused to send me the Airbnb billing statement until I paid him everything in full. This set off red flags for me, and I told him I didn't feel comfortable doing that, and there should be no issue with him sharing the statement. He still refuses to send, and I've told him this is a deal breaker for me, and will simply not go if he can't send me the receipt. I feel bad for the other people in the group that may have to pay more now, but it really seems like the best man inflated the cost of the Airbnb to all of us, and is trying to turn this into a money-making scheme at our expense. Am I the jerk? Update. The groom intervened and got him to send the receipt. He added an extra $250 to the total cost without telling anyone. Pretty much what I'd expected. I'm going to pay him exactly one-tenth of what he paid and share the receipt with the rest of the group. I have no problem paying extra if someone else bails or there ends up being incidental charges but he needs to show transparency instead of not being forthcoming about the price. Not the jerk, and I'd let the other members of the group know that he wouldn't give you the statement. It's pretty clear that there's something not right about this. You would be the jerk if you don't tell the others. Trust no one, especially when it comes to money. No one. Listen to Karen on this, you don't want to have to learn the hard way. Invitation loophole. I was just reminded of this by another thread on this sub, but it happened about 10 years ago when my kid was in kindergarten in a school in a really small town in a rural area. We were new to the area and I had met very few people and even fewer other parents as I had not had time to mix with parents at the one or two events the school had during the few weeks we had been in the district. With my kid's birthday coming up, I knew this would create a problem when it came to having her first big birthday party that consisted of more friends than relatives. The school had a policy that stated that if a kid wanted to invite their classmates to a party via invitations handed out in class, that they had to bring an invitation for every kid in the class. Dumb? Yes. Enforced with gusto? Absolutely. Parents were having parties for 20 to 30 kids every birthday. I'd already seen this with one party we had attended, and through conversations with the two other parents there, I learned of the school's adamant enforcement of this policy, and that the parents hated it. I hadn't even experienced it yet and was already twitching at the thought of 20 to 30 kids my kid may or may not like and possibly at least one parent for each arriving at my small home. 
I could also already hear my husband protesting the invasion of his home by strangers. To say we were a very private couple would be an understatement. It was not going to work, so I hatched a plan. When my own kid's birthday party planning came around, I called the school and arranged a meeting with her teacher. At the meeting, I presented her with a small stack of invitations made out to selected friends of my kid. I explained the situation of me not having contact information for their parents because while social media is great, most people don't sign up as Abby's mom or Zach's grandpa and I was having a hard time getting the invitations out to them. Could she please put the invitations into these kids' take-home folder that afternoon so that the parents could find them? As she was trained to do, she told me she couldn't only put them in the folders for a handful of students because it violated class policy on invitations. Being ready for this, I pulled out the school handbook and opened it to the page I had marked containing the policy and used it to show her that while it says the students may not pass out invitations to only a handful of their peers, it says nothing about a teacher placing the invitations into a folder to be sent home at the end of the day without the students knowing about it during the day. After a moment of thought, she took the invitations, chuckled while shaking her head, and told me she had never had a parent actually schedule a meeting to try to get out of a school rule and win on a well-thought-out technicality, and that she was going to remember it for a long time. Then she asked me if I was an attorney or paralegal. Perhaps? I laughed and told her no, but I did play one in my divorce a couple years prior. She said I missed my calling. I still talk with her when we run into each other now and then. Great lady. The kids had a great party. I finally got contact information for parents when they called to RSVP and we only had to deal with a handful of people in his space. Wins all around. I literally just came from an Am I the Jerk post where a parent only invited five of the kids' closest friends, invitations sent outside of the school, but all the kids talked about it on Monday anyway, so awareness of exactly who was and wasn't invited was immediately known anyway. Invite the whole class. If you can't do that, get help from the other parents or don't host a party until high school when the kids are at an age where they can learn to be discreet. Kindergarten is not that age. Explaining to a six-year-old that they weren't invited to a party because they don't like you enough to invite you is kind of inappropriate, unless that kid has actively been a bully or something that needs that lesson. There's a reason schools have these rules for kids of such a young age. They know more about how to develop a kid's social intelligence than you do. Edit to add. Another solution posted by others is to host a party but charge in order to cover the costs. Then just tell the parents of the kids you actually want there that they don't have to pay. Unpopular opinion, I think the policy is actually quite interesting and has merit. This creates an even playing ground for both popular and unpopular kids. This could stop bullying. Just invite the class next time and have your kid enjoy the day. This isn't about you. So many are commenting on what makes the parent's life easier. Has your kid ever been left out? Has your kid ever seen every other kid get an invitation but themselves? It's heartbreaking, but I'm glad you don't have to make any extra cupcakes at your little darling's party. Jerk. Are the people on Reddit really getting upset that OP didn't invite the entire class to their kid's birthday? Yes, Karen, they most certainly are. Come on, you guys. You don't invite the entire class of 30 kids to your house for your birthday. Come on, guys. <laughs> Relax, Karen. You see what reading this stuff does to her? I just don't understand how people have become such idiots. Well, you're on Reddit now, Karen. You better get used to it. Am I the jerk for taking a trip with just me and my kids after my fiancé went alone on a trip with his family? Me, 27 female, and my fiancé, Josh, 28 male, have been together for five years. We have twins who are one and a half. Josh's family and I don't have a close relationship for some reasons. They're horrible people. Josh is a ball out of turn. All of his family trips, it's always pretty clear that they didn't invite me and Josh always says it's their family thing, so they feel uncomfortable with me. To be quite honest, I felt re from that, so I never went in the past. But with the arrival of the twins and a lockdown, the trips didn't happen. About three months ago, Josh said there would be a family trip to a city in another state, three hours by plane. I was really excited as it would be the twins' first trip. He said he would organize everything. Three weeks ago, travel would be in 12 days, I started packing the twins' clothes and looking for clothes for myself. Josh saw me putting my clothes on and asked what I was doing. When I said I was packing my clothes for the trip, he said, Baby, it's my family's trip. 
You know it's a special thing, like my brother-in-law and sister-in-law. I just bought it for me and the twins. Keep in mind that none of his brothers have kids, only girlfriends or fiancés. I said that and asked if he planned to take our kids and not me. And when he said yes, I just laughed and called him deluded because I wouldn't let them go to another state without me and I wouldn't sign the authorization either. He asked me to sign. Babies need authorization from both parents. We argued a lot and he got angry, saying I was depriving our kids from his family. In short, he went alone. And after so much humiliation, I decided to go on a mini vacation in a country house one hour away by car. Josh and I didn't talk these days. He arrived yesterday and the house was empty. He called me asking where I was and I said I took a vacation. He had the nerve to ask if he could join, but I was sincere in saying that I wanted space. He knows where I am and to spend time with the kids. He started to say how hypocritical I was to go on a trip with them and he couldn't, that I was being mean and vindictive. It's escalated to the point that even his family are calling me a hypocrite and cruel for not allowing a moment between them. I just wanted to have peace with my twins after going through such a humiliation and I'm thinking about leaving early. I would go on Sunday. Am I the jerk? Extra. Well, in case you have any doubts, the biggest reason I didn't let the twins go is in fact being another state thousands of kilometers away from where I live. The city I'm in is a district of mine, one hour by car, even less. He wanted to go somewhere that's three hours by plane and more than one day by car. If something happened, I wouldn't be able to get there fast. If it was close to where they would go, it would be something else. Your fiancé needs to grow a backbone and stand up to his family to include you, the mother of his kids, and family activities. It's a huge red flag that he's not done so to date. You describe him as your fiancé. Is there a set wedding date? I would think he would want this resolved before you get married. I recommend pre-marriage family counseling. Not the jerk. Not the jerk. The problem here is when you marry someone, you basically marry their family. You married a pack of jerks. If your marriage is going to survive, Josh needs to realize he is no longer mommy's little boy. He's an adult, married, and you have two kids. Artist's sister-in-law wants my husband and I to support her instead of getting a real job. My husband, 39 male, and I, 37 female, had been married for eight years and we have two kids. He and his sister, my sister-in-law, who's 31, have always been close despite the age difference. There's also a brother in between who isn't relevant to this post. Sister-in-law is an artist who has been working full-time on her art since graduating from school several years ago. I respect art and believe it can absolutely be someone's full-time job, but the fact is that she's never made any money off of her art aside from selling the occasional piece to a family friend. I don't want to pass judgment on her art because I'm no expert, a STEM person here, but she's been trying to make it for years and years at this point and hasn't gained any traction. I don't think she's going to start making money off of it anytime soon. Still, she considers her art her career and my husband is supportive and proud of her. We own multiple pieces of hers. Her parents were fully supporting her financially until a couple of years ago when she moved in with her boyfriend who took over. She and the boyfriend broke up earlier this year and she moved into a nice apartment funded by her parents. Unfortunately, my in-laws recently passed suddenly and unexpectedly. It was devastating. What they left behind will support sister-in-law for a while, but not forever, and not in the standard of living she's accustomed to, which includes having to move out of her current apartment. Husband told me he wanted to give her money every month so that she can keep working full-time on her art and maintain her standard of living. We both fortunately have high paying jobs and a lot already saved for our kids so we could easily afford it. However, I don't like the idea of supporting a non-disabled adult forever who could make her own living but chooses not to. I'm okay with helping her out temporarily while she starts working and figures out how to make her own living, but not forever. I don't care if she starts out at minimum wage, she just has to be doing something that will make money and start her path to independence. I did slip up and call it a real job to my husband. She and husband are both telling me that I'm the jerk because if she has to work full time, she won't have time anymore for her art and that being an artist is a real job already. He says I don't understand the sibling bond since I'm an only child. His other brother agrees with me and says it would be about time sister-in-law got out into the real world. Am I the jerk? Edit. 
sister-in-law has submitted to work to many galleries, tried to sell her art online via social media, etc. She's tried to sell to a larger audience than family friends and family members but hasn't gotten any bites, so her not selling her work widely isn't for lack of trying, unfortunately. I'm not sure if it's because she's not great at promotion or because the market doesn't want what she's selling. Getting sent home for doing what I was told to do, then in trouble for going home. Years and years ago, I was working for a fast food restaurant. I was a crew trainer and part of the crew trainer training was watching some videos talking about your responsibility. One of those responsibilities was called coaching. If you see someone, even a manager, had actually said those words on the video, doing something incorrectly, you were to coach them on the correct procedures. I'm sure you can see where this is going. So flash forward some time and I was working with a manager nobody liked. I witnessed the manager do something wrong. Specifically, she poured out two medium fries to make a large fry to give to a customer. That was a big no-no. You were never supposed to take an already packaged item and use it to make a smaller or larger package. So cue malicious compliance. And next time I saw the manager, I simply said to her that what she did was wrong and that she should have waited for fresh fries to finish cooking. Well, she looked at me and said that I am a manager and I don't have to follow the rules. Go and clock out now and go home. So I did. I went and punched out, grabbed my jacket and started walking out of the store. She came up behind me and said, I want to talk to you before you go. I turned and said, sorry, you had me clocked out. I'm no longer working and you can no longer keep me here to talk. You should have done this before I clocked out. And I walked out of the door. She tried to get me in trouble and fired, tried to claim that I walked off the job, tried to claim that she never told me to clock out. However, there were too many witnesses to the whole ordeal and she couldn't get her way. Too many of my friends I worked with told the store manager my story was 100% accurate and that she was lying. I have no idea why he kept her after this, but he did. I ended up quitting a few months later because she made my life heck every time I worked with her. Then later she got fired for trying to get the store manager fired. So in the end, she lost. Karen loses it on me for shopping at a thrift store. I went thrift shopping this morning. My husband, who's 30, and I, 38, are expecting our first baby in a couple of months, so I've been getting stuff ready for the baby. I hate paying retail prices when I don't really know what he will need. I also hate being wasteful and the ecological impact. So I've been buying some of his onesies and the like from a not-for-profit thrift shop in my area. I've been thrifting since college, whether Poshmark or brick-and-mortar thrift shops, and I've never thought anything of it if the stuff was nice and well-priced. While shopping, I started chatting with another lady who was pregnant and shopping for her baby as well. We were laughing and having a good time enjoying our deals and excitement over our babies. We were going back and forth about the good deals we had found, like I got a very lightly used pottery barn crib online. She got a glider still in the box from a different thrift shop. We both finished and went to check out. As we were walking out, I was getting ready to invite her to coffee when she saw my car and she said in a really weird tone, You drive a Tesla? I wasn't really sure how to reply except, Yeah, I really like it, and moved on. Her demeanor changed instantly, like I had done something truly horrendous. She read me the riot act about taking advantage of thrift stores and charity when I clearly don't need it, that I was robbing the poor and asking me how dare I could do that. I had never seen it that way. I just thought of it as not being wasteful and supporting a good cause. I apologized for offending her and told her I did not see it the same way, but the conversation ended with her telling me to go forget myself and storming off. So am I the jerk here? Is there a certain income level or point where it is unethical to buy second hand? Ultimately, not the jerk, but I do see where this other woman is coming from. A lot of thrift shops have started raising prices because thrifting has become so popular, which kind of defeats the purpose. It also means that the shop no longer has those items for someone else who needs them, but genuinely may not be able to afford anything but thrift shop prices. Maybe try to keep more to Poshmark, eBay, etc. than the brick and mortar shops. 1000% agree with this as someone who survived on charity shops growing up. While it's good not to waste, just be mindful that poor people simply won't be able to get the things they need if they can't get them from charity stores, whereas you, OP, have the means to buy new if you can't find what you want. If my family couldn't get a couch or a mattress or dining table from the charity shop, 
we just didn't have one. Slept on air mattresses and sat on the floor. It could be good to leave those rare fine items and simply buy from ethical stores, eBay, whatever. If you have the Tesla, I'm guessing you make enough to be able to go to stores that are more expensive but are committed to sustainability. Also, anyone who thrifts just to sell on Depop or eBay is words this sub prohibits. I'm a former board member of a charity thrift store and we desperately want you to shop with us. We use that money to support the charitable work we do. All customers are welcome. Not the jerk. She's clearly got some insecurities about finances though and may have just been projecting them on you. While she was a tool, don't judge her too harshly yet as you never know what's going on behind the scene. Anyway, you're all good. You're the jerk. Why y'all always trying to take from us? You know you got enough money to buy new clothes if you drive a Tesla. I don't blame her for going off on your behind. I would have done the same darn thing. You out here driving foreign cars while I'm having to have more babies just to get my check from the government to stay up with inflation. You just don't know what struggle is with yo rich, entitled, spoiled little self. I swear I'm tired of y'all coming at me with this BS and you really want to act like you ain't know this was wrong? What you gonna do next? Go to the food pantry because it's the hip thing to do? Taking from folks who ain't got nothing. You ought to be ashamed of yourself for real jerk. P.S. That boy Elon Musk do look like an alien though. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for shopping at the thrift store or not? Please let us know. I used to go to Goodwill myself back in the day, but these days they're so expensive I find cheaper stuff at Walmart now. I knew my job, but the new manager thought he knew it better. So I used to work for one of the top delivery companies in the UK. There was a lot less competition 15 years ago. I was very good at my specific delivery job and I often undertook every office task from single delivery routes to maintaining the office and delivery distribution to all routes. Then one day, in comes the new manager. And it was the cliche that you dread. You probably all have met the type. Suit slightly too big and a trainee mustache. He had just finished uni and to his credit, he got himself a business degree. The problem with this company was every office around the whole country was run differently and this poor manager was expecting every person to do things by the letter. But most of the work was done on goodwill since we were allowed to finish for the day when we had completed our deliveries. It was creating a rod for our own backs, to be honest, but it was nice to finish earlier on lighter days. Finally, on his third day, after watching me daily and asking me why I was doing things in certain orders, I told him my delivery route was complex and required it to be done in a certain order to ensure the time deliveries got there before 1 p.m. and the other delivery staff were fed their delivery materials by myself at certain times to ensure optimum delivery speeds and minimum delay. He replied, no, it doesn't work like that. I simply stared for a bemused few seconds and said I don't understand. He wanted it by the letter today, as per company guidelines. I argued very hard against it and said he will really regret it because we won't complete, but he insisted I was wrong because it was all timed and measured. So after an exasperated 15-minute heated discussion, I did as I was told, to the letter. The five staff I fed deliveries to weren't happy, but understood. It was like a domino effect of carnage. At 12.30 p.m., we all rang in the office to report the failed time deliveries, which he promptly freaked out about because they were strictly monitored. The subsequent enforced break times and shuffling required also left 15 to 20% of each walk unfinished, which he also now has to complete himself on top of the timed ones. He had to fill out reports for all failed 1 p.m. deliveries, all walk failures, and then had to call in managers from the other offices to finish it all. They all finished around four hours late. He was not popular. The next day he came to me and asked me to show him the mechanics of the delivery route in detail because I didn't expect that to happen if I'm honest. It was close enough to an apology for me. We actually became good friends over time, but he never questioned me when I said nope ever again. Am I the jerk for refusing to give someone her grandma's jewelry back? I, 26 female, bought a hoarder house back in May of 2018. It's a big six bedroom, four and a half bathroom house. When I bought it, the contract stated that I take ownership of the house and everything in it. The lady who owned it had passed and her heirs could not deal with the stench and literal mountains of junk and waste in it. 
You could only open the door not even eight inches, and some rooms had junk filling them wall to wall and floor to ceiling. Well, it took me these last four years to finish cleaning, fixing, and updating it. While doing the cleaning, I made sure to check everything before throwing it out. Ended with more than $20,000 worth of money, some nice jewelry and antique furniture, and finally, a stunning 40s-style lace-covered wedding dress. This woman took care of that dress until she couldn't anymore, and it took just some minor work to restore it. I currently don't have a partner, but I decided that it would be the dress I will be wearing if I ever get married. While doing the cleaning, I reached to the heirs to pass on some pictures and mementos, Christmas ornaments, artwork, and because of that, I had one of them, who's in her 30s, on my Facebook friends list. After repairing the dress, I put it on with the jewelry and posted a pic on Facebook. Well, this woman saw it and asked for the dress and heirlooms back. I refused to give them back, and legally, they can't do anything. Also, if they meant that much to them, they should have cleaned the house on their own, not sell it to me. Now she and all her family are calling me out on social media. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Recovering hoarder here. Legally, you are in the right. Morally, you are also in the right. And though I cannot speak for the woman whose things you now own, I can give you insight into how I would feel if I passed before I could find homes for my treasures. I would want someone who cared enough to restore and respect the items to have them. You saw the beauty in them, as did she. You didn't just chuck it all in a dumpster. Take them, wear them, be happy to honor the original owner. Her family did not view these things as anything but a hassle. Not the jerk. It's a lot to clean a hoarder's house. They could have hired a service if they were mentally unable to do it, but instead they dumped it on someone else who paid them to take the house and all that's in it. If they cared about the items, they should have offered you money or asked you to keep an eye out. It's yours. You did the work. I don't care how cheap you got the house. It probably doesn't even out, like someone said, because hoarding houses are disasters. Simply put, and it takes a lot of time to clean and restore them. Not the jerk. You bought it, and then, more importantly, you did a ton of work to save and restore these things. Honestly, if I were the grandma, I'd rather have my stuff go to a random stranger who gave a hoot than anyone else. Also, on that note, I'm going to call out everyone in the comments, fortunately not that many, who say that this dress is more important to the family member. Um, no. It's not that important to the family. Their convenience was more important. Now that all of the hard work is done, suddenly it all means so much more to them. That's ridiculous. My grandmother was a hoarder, and my family spent months cleaning out her house after she passed. We did that because our family heirlooms and history meant something to us. It wasn't easy. It was costly and time-consuming and miserable and really important. You don't get to come back later, after all the work is done, and decide you're suddenly entitled to the fruit of someone else's work. I'm going to have to go with you're the jerk. While you may legally own those items, and they could have looked through the house themselves, once you've opened up communication with the family and friended them on Facebook, flaunting their grandma's stuff, and expensive stuff at that, is like rubbing their loss of heirlooms in their faces. There are many reasons people sell homes as is. People on this subreddit seem to think it's just because they didn't care enough to look through it themselves. But more than likely, other factors, like mental health, grief, managing debt after a loss, were all huge factors. Maybe they made a difficult decision and sold the house to pay for a funeral. Who knows? It doesn't mean that what's in the house isn't still significant. OP clearly said that the dress looked like it had been taken care of, probably more than other things in the home which means that this lady probably wanted to pass on her wedding dress. Flaunting that and her valuable possessions in front of the family through Facebook is thoughtless behavior. To echo what others have said, what is legal and moral are two different things. Well, what do you think? Should OP give back the dress or the heirlooms or not? Please let us know. I don't know. I mean, I'd give them back. I wouldn't feel like I have to, but I would just do it to, you know, be nice, I guess. The police have been called on me. So I just had a hotel guest call the cops on me. Whomever does night audit and security is allowed to park their car on the edge inside the wide carport. People can still drive through it. This is a boon for us because we like to keep an eye out on our cars during these hours. Years earlier, I had somebody mess with my car twice when I parked further away while doing 3 to 11 p.m. Anywho, every now and then the carport will have a guest temporarily park in my spot behind security while they check in. No big deal, 
I can temporarily park in the loading bay until it clears out, about 50 feet away. However, soon after clocking in, an extremely angry lady came to the front desk and demanded a car be towed because it was in a handicapped spot without a sticker. She showed a picture on her phone and it was mine. I explained to her that it was my car, probably a mistake, but it was not a handicapped spot. I told her it was a loading bay typically used for deliveries like food trucks. The area it's at is next to the handicapped spots, but there's not a handicapped sign. It's about three times the space of a regular parking spot, and it has vertical lines in it from top to bottom. The lady responded, Well, it's not any kind of parking spot. I agreed, and then asked her if she can acknowledge that, then why was she treating it like a parking spot? She didn't give an answer, and we repeated this cycle of conversation. She kept making exaggerated facial expressions that came across as condescending and snooty, as if she didn't believe me. The guy working behind the desk at the property... She walked towards the front door, loudly saying she was going to tell her husband. I called after her. Please do. As she was exiting, I heard her yell out to somebody. You're going to flip your lid, the guy said. By the way, the husband never came inside or called me. I saw another person on the camera, but it was dark and they quickly walked off to building C. We have four buildings. About five minutes later, my security person asked me why the police were here. I got a sense of dread and thought, she better not have called the cops. Yes, yes she did. The police officer said they got a call from a person not wanting to identify themselves about this situation. He was parked on the edge of the carport and said, there's not even a handicap sign there. We talked about it and kind of found the whole situation funny. The cop was able to tell I was not in a parking spot, handicap or otherwise, from 50 feet away in the dark. He waved it off and said don't worry about it. And even if there was a real case, it's up to the property to have a car towed or removed, not the police. The fact that she didn't want to give her identity makes me think she knew she was in the wrong. Don't mess with the trash man. Back in the late 90s, I worked for my brother who owned a small private trash hauling company. So small that I was the only employee and he had just two rear load trash trucks. On this day, we were running together on one of the trucks. Him as the driver and me as the helper. We had placed a four cubic yard dumpster for a homeowner who was using it for a garbage cleanout. After emptying the dumpster once or twice, the homeowner stopped paying his trash removal bill. After repeated attempts to contact the homeowner with no response, we decided it was time to get the dumpster back for use by someone who would pay for their service. When we got to the home, the dumpster was sitting right in front of the garage with about 30 feet from the street to the garage. Of course, the dumpster was overloaded with all the remaining rubbish from the homeowner's cleanout. My brother backed up to the dumpster, parked the truck, and we jumped out. We knocked on the doors to the house to see if anyone was home who we could talk to or if there was a payment taped to the door, but no one answered and there was no payment. With no response, we proceeded to empty the dumpster into our truck. Most times we were considerate and picked up the trash that fell onto the ground while emptying a dumpster. But today, we let it fall without the slightest concern. It took less than five minutes to load the truck with the contents of the dumpster. Once the dumpster was empty, my brother jumped into the truck and we left with the dumpster, with me riding in the back of the truck. However, as we pulled out of the driveway, I was unlatching a turnbuckle that kept the truck's tailgate mounted firmly to the truck's body. Once on the street, my brother stopped so I could drop the dumpster to the ground. As he reversed the truck into the homeowner's driveway, I was unlatching the turnbuckle on the other side of the truck. As soon as the truck came to a stop in front of the garage where the dumpster once stood, I was already at the outside controls of the truck, pulling the handle to raise the tailgate. In one swift motion, I then pulled the other handle, the one that pushed the blade inside the trash truck to the rear, ejecting the trash that once was in the dumpster back onto the homeowner's driveway. See, when we had come for the dumpster, we had just come from the landfill so the truck had been empty. All the trash in the truck had come from the homeowner's dumpster. We unloaded the truck in about 15 seconds. As we pulled out of the driveway, I jogged alongside the truck, simultaneously pushing both handles to retract the blade and lower the tailgate. I quickly latched the turnbuckles and reattached the dumpster to the truck. After I jumped back into the truck, we drove off, but we noticed movement behind us. A couple teens who had been inside the house had jumped into a car and were giving chase to us. We paid them no mind. When we got back to the shop, 
the teens confronted my brother about the mess we had left in their driveway. After asking if they were the homeowner and hearing that they were the homeowner's kids, my brother told them he was not talking to them. He told them to have the homeowner contact our lawyer. Since they were trespassing, we shooed them off our property. The bill went to collections with an unknown resolution, but we got our dumpster back. They never even came to say hi. So this was about nine years ago. I had just gotten medically retired from the army and my wife and I found our current home. The original portion of the home was built in 1900 and it had been improved and expanded upon the following century. Best parts, near middle of the city, though on the poor side of the tracks. No HOA and still had 1.6 acres attached. Bad part, near a government subsidized housing project, but also within a block of the county police garage, so figured not an issue. Almost immediately, we encountered people walking their dogs through our yard like it was some kind of unfenced dog park. When I would try greeting them, they would just turn away and ignore me. So after a couple weeks, I just started calling over that since they don't even want to say hi, they should know it's private property, that they're trespassing, and that I will call the police. When that did not appear to work, I started taking video of myself doing so and did call the police. When they denied ever being told, I could then show the police multiple videos with date stamps. That seemed to make things die down for about a month, until one morning, my wife went out our back door with her Pomeranian to be met by one of said neighbors with his pit bull, just waiting by our back door that instantly started snapping and growling at her. He immediately left before I could get a video or the cops could arrive. We love pit bulls, by the way. A couple days later, several youngsters rode over on motorbikes while we were gone and turned the grass on the far side of our property into a torn up dirt bike track. I had put up a game camera. Enough was enough. I contacted several contractors for bids and contracted for a six-foot wood privacy fence all the way around. Construction started up and was done in two days. The first morning after it was up, I got a banging on our front door and answered it to find a couple with their doggo on a leash. As soon as I opened the door, neighbors, we had an agreement with the previous owners and you've blocked us from our dog park. Me, well, good morning to you too. Neighbor, are you listening to me? We had an agreement and you violated it. Me, not with me, and you all have been so rude, you can go buzz off with jackhammers. Neighbor, looking a bit shocked. Look, you need to open the gates right now. Me, what was his name? Whose name? The previous owner. Neighbor doesn't say anything. Me, look jerk, I tried being nice, I tried talking. Neighbor, now look. Me, in booming former drill command voice. Shut your mouth, you waste of air. Deer in headlight stares. I tried being nice. My wife tried being nice. No one cared to even say hi. Even when on our property, much less a, hi, welcome to the neighborhood. You couldn't name the previous owner and you've acted like a total jerk. So stay off my land or I'll have you arrested for trespassing. It's private property. And while we could have worked something out, you were jerks. So buzz off and tell the others to do likewise or I'll have them arrested too. And I slammed the door in their faces. I made sure to post no trespassing and video surveillance signs as well, as well as keeping the gates locked. We've had a few problems over the years, but they've been few and scattered. We've made friends with a few folks in the neighborhood, including a nice older couple who bring their two dogs over to play with our Pomeranians from time to time and love watching our daughter run around laughing with the whole little pack of doggos. There's also James, who is struggling with being a single father to three girls. He'll bring over the girls and his lab and hurl a football across the entire yard for his lab and my big mutt to chase while we chill with a couple cold ones. There have been some minor issues, but as a whole, nothing like what we went through the first three to four months. Though someone does keep raiding our gardens and fruit trees, I've got them on camera but have yet to be able to identify them. Otherwise, I keep my eyes open. Am I the jerk for telling my brother that he is at fault for his marriage failing? This week, my parents and my brother took me out for my birthday. My brother was a bit down because his divorce was finalized earlier this summer. He's living with my mom and dad temporarily because he was no longer eligible to live in military housing once the divorce was final. I've never been married, so I don't understand, but I try to be supportive. Doing things like taking him out so he isn't just sitting in the house all day while my parents are at work or proofreading his resume. 
I do understand that he's going through some stuff, but he spent the entire night complaining, and no matter what anyone said or did, he was negative. I tried to ignore it, but when he made a comment about our waitress while we were walking back to the car, simply because she was wearing an engagement ring, I snapped. The waitress didn't mention marriage at all, and her service was fine. My brother said she probably lied to her boyfriend to get him to agree to marry her. I snapped and told my brother that his wife didn't lie and his marriage failing was his fault. My brother met my ex-sister-in-law when she had just finished her medical residency and newly in the military. They met in 2008 and got married in 2010. From the start, she told my brother she never wanted kids. She was open about being childless by choice to everyone. He dated her and married her. This whole time, he thought she would change her mind, and after all this time, he got mad at her when she got mad at him for pressuring her to have kids. I didn't marry her, and I knew she was childless by choice. It wasn't a secret. She divorced him because he wouldn't stop pressuring her to have kids and get her tubes untied. He went so far as to try and change the divorce ground from no fault to fraud, claiming she entered the marriage under false pretenses. That didn't go anywhere. He maintains she lied, and he is also mad he wasted so much time with her. Before I snapped at him, I never said anything. His divorce was none of my business, and I only tried to be a supportive brother. But his comment about the waitress pushed me over the edge. He wants me to say sorry to him, but I'm not sorry. I've listened to him complain for months since she filed for divorce, and it's only gotten worse since he moved back here. I've tried to be supportive and helpful as much as I can. Was I the jerk for snapping at him? He's still upset about it. Not the jerk, but also you're probably not going to get him to see reason. The literal years of him expecting his ex to change her mind should tell you that he's someone who crafts the narrative he wants when confronted with someone telling him something he doesn't want to hear. Not the jerk. He made his bed. The fraud was all in his own mind, assuming his ex would change her mind just because he was so wonderful and it would be a crime against humanity not to replicate his genes in some form. What a jerk. She's better off without him, and so too would you be. I am allergic. Now, I'm aware you can be allergic to beef, nuts, sesame seeds, etc., and all those 10 delivery orders daily stating they're all allergic to tomato. But after all these years working in a restaurant, I've realized one thing. A lot of people lie about allergies only to make sure they accidentally don't get tomatoes in their burger because they really hate tomatoes. The walk-in people, for instance, who are truly allergic have a different type of demeanor when they ask about something they're allergic to, and I gladly make sure to help them out because we don't want to get sued. I mean, because we want to give them a pleasant experience. For instance, today when a moron came in with his girlfriend and wanted to order something. Moron. I want that lamb dish. Me. You mean the lamb beef? As it's clearly stated in the menu. Jerk. No, lamb only. No beef. Me. It's already mixed. You can't have just the lamb. It's not chunks mixed in together. It's literally grounded together, so you couldn't separate it if you wanted to. And the worst part is, he was looking at the meat as he was ordering it. Jerk. I'm allergic to beef. I only want the lamb. Me. Well then, you can't eat that dish since it's mixed together. His girlfriend, clearly irritated with him. We'll have that dish. Thank you. They ordered only that since it's a big plate. Me. Okay, so you're not allergic then? Silence. Edit. Forgot to add, me and the chef were talking about it, and the chef whispered to me that we didn't get lamb with the delivery, so it's actually made of only beef, and not even lamb beef. This never happens normally, only on the one day he walked in. Ex's divorce lawyer. Send three years of complete financials or else. Me. As you wish. This happened several years ago when my ex and I were going through a heated divorce and custody battle. While we were married, we had a couple of conversations about how rich people hide their assets to avoid paying taxes. I've never had enough assets to do this, but she somehow got the idea that I was and told her attorney that I was laundering money and hiding income. It was more likely the heat of the moment as a divorce custody battle often comes down to. I couldn't even afford my own attorney, so I represented myself. Her lawyer wasn't a total jerk, but he clearly was out to get me, and he talked down to me like I didn't deserve to breathe the same air. One day, I get a letter in the mail from him requesting an updated income declarations form and three years of financials. It had a long list of things to include. 
I own a communications tech company that was in super startup phase back then. Money was already tight. I was trying to get this business off the ground with no financing. I was finishing my MBA with scholarships and loans, so paying for copies and postage or driving this 30 miles to his office meant eating peanut butter and saltines for a week. So I called him to explain my situation. He all but called me a liar and didn't believe I couldn't afford it. I was put off by that and I said this was taking time away from business I needed to handle. To which he replied, and I'll never forget this. Well, according to your income declarations, you're not that busy. What do you do all day? He then said if I didn't get these documents, he would consider my previous filings as fraudulent. Tell the judge, contact the DA, and also alert the state tax agency and IRS. Probably an empty threat, but I'm no lawyer. Efax is one of the services my company provides, and at this time it was relatively unknown. So I asked him if he has a fax machine. He said he had a fax, scanner, and a copier device, then said what law office doesn't have a fax machine, and I suddenly got an idea. Okay, I said to him, I'll put together and fax whatever I can. Okay, jerk. You want three years of financials? You got it. I scanned to PDF every receipt I could find. McDonald's receipt from five years ago? Oh well, won't hurt to include it. CVS receipt. It's three miles long. Perfect. They got the $1 off toothpaste coupons too. I downloaded every bank statement, credit card statement, purchase orders from vendors, and every invoice I sent to clients. I printed to PDF the entire three-year accounting journal, monthly, quarterly, annual balance sheets, cash flow statements, P&Ls. Not only did I PDF three years of tax filings, but every single letter I received from the IRS and state tax agency, including the inserts advising me of my rights. It took a while, but I was a few days ahead of the deadline. I made a cover page, black background with white lettering. Wherever I could, I included separator pages in all caps and the biggest, boldest font that would fit on the page and landscape. Receipts, taxes, etc. I merged everything into a single 150 plus page compressed PDF and sent the document using my eFax system. Every hour or so, I received a status email saying the fax failed. Huh? That's weird. Well, they're getting this document. So I changed the system configuration to unlimited retries after failures to keep redialing until it went through. Weird. I was still getting status email failures. I'll delete the failure emails and keep the success one after it eventually goes through, I thought. Problem solved. Two days later, a lady from his office called and asked me to stop sending the fax. Their fax, scanner, printer, and copier had been printing non-stop. It kept getting paper jams, kept running out of ink, and they had to keep shutting it off and back on to print. I explained that her boss told me to send this by the deadline or else he would call the DA and IRS. Since I didn't want to call from the DA or the IRS, I would keep sending until I got a success confirmation. I suggested they just not print until my fax completes, but she didn't like that. She asked me to email the documents, and I told a little white lie that my email wouldn't allow an attachment that big. Unless her boss, in writing, agreed to cancel the request or agreed to reimburse me for my costs to print and ship, I said I would continue to fax until they confirm they have received every page. She put me on hold, and the attorney gets on the line. He said, forget sending the financials. I said that I would need this in writing, so I will keep sending the fax until he sent that to me. He asked me to stop faxing, and he would send it in writing. And I said, send it in writing first, and then I'll stop. Long moment of silence. Click. About 20 minutes later, I received an email from his assistant with an attached, signed letter in PDF that I no longer needed to provide financials. The letter then threatened to pursue sanctions in court or sue me for interfering with their business. Every time I saw him after that, the lawyer never brought up sanctions, lawsuits, criminal referrals, or financials again. My Karen stepmom demands I give up my room for her daughter. So I, 16 female, live with my dad since he and my mom split up and just recently he got married to Kelly. Kelly has a daughter who's 13 and a son who's 9 and they just moved in with us. My dad and I's house has four rooms, the master bedroom has a master bathroom inside of it, and my room is just a little bit smaller, but it also has a bathroom in the room too. Then there are the other two rooms that don't have a bathroom but have walk-in closets, unlike mine. All of the rooms have beds and dressers, you know, all the stuff that makes a room a room, without the personal decorations that you choose. 
When they came to move in, her daughter ran straight past one of the vacant rooms and into mine. My walls are purple and I have Marvel and DC posters hanging up on the wall. I also have a mirror attached to my dresser with lights around it. So once I showed her son to the room he would be sleeping in, I went into my room and saw her bringing her stuff into my room. And so I told her that this isn't her room and that she has to have one of the rooms with no decorations. She immediately starts flipping out. She started yelling, saying she was going to tell her mom and my dad that I'm being mean to her and trying to bully her because she was younger. Her mom and my dad came into the room due to all the yelling and asked what was going on. And so I told them that she thinks my room is hers and she won't leave. But she said that this has to be her room because it's her favorite color, purple, and it has a bathroom, so it has to be hers. My dad explained to her that she can get her room painted whatever color she wants, and we can get her the posters and pictures she wants also, but she said she doesn't want a room that doesn't have a bathroom, so this one should be hers. Her mom ended up agreeing with her, saying that I've had this room for a very long time, and I can just restart in the other room, and I should give it to her since she's younger. So I told her that I won't give up my room, because this has all of my stuff in it, and I'm comfortable in my room, so her daughter will have to go to the other only available room. She's saying that I'm being rude and mean to my new little sister, and I should be reasonable and give her my room and be the bigger person and act my age, and not like a little kid. So, am I the jerk? Edit. I see a lot of people are asking how my dad feels and what's his opinion on this, and he said that I can choose to do whatever because it's my room, and I'm old enough to talk for myself. Not the jerk. She's 13, not 3. It's your room. It was your room before your dad married, and it should be your room until you move out. Don't budge on this. Make sure your dad keeps supporting you. Good luck. If no ages were mentioned, I could have very well thought that she was 3. If she's this entitled from the very beginning, I can't imagine how terrible it would be to live with her long term. I really feel bad for OP. 1000%, not the jerk. Now that you mention living with her long term, OP needs to get a lock and keep the door locked whenever she's not in there or Step Brad may end up in there stealing her stuff or breaking her things. Not the jerk. You shouldn't have to start over in a new room. Plus, in my experience, the eldest kids get to pick their rooms and then down to the youngest. This is because when the old kids move out, the younger ones can then have their rooms. Your stepmom is being stupid and setting a precedent that won't end well. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her stepmom? Please let us know. I'm really disappointed dad isn't stepping in here and going off on them. You don't just come into someone's house and demand to take their room. My boyfriend dumps me for sending him a photo of me at the hospital. I, 20 female, was recently admitted into a hospital for a night due to a serious but not life-threatening illness. I was completely out of it for several days with horrible pain before my roommate convinced me to get medical help. She took off work to stay with me in the hospital and I cannot express how much her support has helped as my own family lives too far away. Now, I've been dating Sam, who's 19, for about 9 months. He knew I was sick and so I texted him when I was first going into the hospital to update him. Since he was working, he didn't read the message until much later. I sent him around 6 text messages updating him with what the nurses were saying and including a photo of me on IV giving a thumbs up. It was my first time ever in the hospital and I just wanted to keep the bad situation as lighthearted as possible. He responded a few hours later with a thumbs up and that was all. I asked if everything was alright and he said, Yeah, just you being in the hospital is giving me a lot of anxiety. I'd rather not see you looking like that. I told him that was okay and didn't message him for the rest of the night, not thinking much of it. The next afternoon, his mom called me asking if I was okay. She had the impression that I sent him the hospital photo after he told me not to share any information and was disrespecting his request. She reminded me that his grandfather only passed a year earlier where Sam had to spend a lot of time in and out of the hospital, so the updates were making him grieve all over again. I apologized to her and sent him a text saying that I didn't mean to hurt his feelings. He left me on red. My roommate thinks that I didn't do anything wrong at all and he's being too sensitive and immature for involving his mom. Personally, I think this is a bit unfair as he was really close with his grandfather and struggles with anxiety. I really feel guilty now as I know how mental health can be and I never want him to suffer. Am I the jerk? Update. This morning I woke up to a text from Sam asking for a break. 
He told me he needed to focus on himself and that there's too much drama in this relationship. I agree. I've been with Sam through all of his anxiety attacks, holding him, crying in my arms more times than I can count. He has never done the same for me. I've made excuses over and over again for this behavior. I've begged him to go to therapy and he's always refused. This hospital stay and your comments have been eye-opening. Oh, and for his mom? She reminded me to let go of my feeling and do what's best for me. I'm starting up therapy because I'll be needing the support when you're gone. I actually laughed out loud at that one. She hasn't reached out to me yet and I hope she never does. My roommate and I are figuring out how to end things once and for all. So yep, yeah, that's it for now. Feeling a lot of emotions, but I know it's for the best. Also, thank you so much to the lovely Redditors who have given me advice and wished me well. I'm doing much better and I appreciate it a ton. It's like lobsters. You've just measured him, he's not grown enough. Put him back in the sea. I had one boyfriend, he was 26 at the time, who visited me once when I was in the hospital for a week. We'd been together for two years and were living together. We didn't last. My next boyfriend was 21 when I was hospitalized. I was in between their ages, on our first anniversary of meeting. He was in the hospital with me holding the cardboard, chuck up trays, and visited every day. Both had difficult shift patterns. I'm still with number two now, 19 years later. You're not the jerk unless you break fishing law and don't return the baby lobster to the sea. Not the jerk. His mom called you to say how disrespectful you are while you're recovering in the hospital? That's a new one. You would have had to be told to not share pictures or any more messages or pics before not considering his feelings. Life is tough and you were reaching out for support. Not the jerk. And please leave your boyfriend and his mother. He's more concerned about his feelings than about how you're doing. He didn't even ask how you were or hope you felt better or anything. That's wrong. I want to write something else. Very rude here. You're in a hospital bed for the first time ever, in pain, and you shouldn't be the one worrying about him suffering. Rethink your priorities and what you want in a boyfriend. Not the jerk. This guy isn't ready to be an adult, let alone in a relationship. You were in the hospital, and rather than expressing concern, he talked about his own anxiety, and then he sent his mommy after you. Run. Red flags. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her boyfriend and his mom? Please let us know. He sounds like even more of a mummy's boy than you, Reddit boy. Am I the jerk for mentioning my best friend's former crush on me at his wedding? Okay, I'm currently in a predicament, and frankly, I could really use some opinions. For backstory, I, female 27, met one of my best friends, Christian, male 26, back in 2010 during our freshman year of high school. We became friends and remained close over the years since, making a lot of great memories and sharing mutual close friends. From 2013 to 2016, Christian had pretty serious unrequited feelings for me. However, he eventually got over me and I had never even let his feelings harm our friendship. If anything, our friendship honestly got closer after he got over me. In early 2018, Christian met Victoria, female 29, at a bar and they hit it off. They started dating after two weeks, got engaged in late 2021 and the wedding happened yesterday night. It was honestly a great time as I watched with my parents and mutual friends as the kid I've known for 12 years was getting married to the love of his life. Plus, Victoria and I honestly had a pretty decent relationship and according to Christian, she didn't really seem to care about his past feelings as time went on. Anyway, as the night kept going with a lot of music and dancing, I got up to eventually give a speech for Christian. I talked about how we first met, how much our lives changed since then, and just how great of a person Christian was. The attendees were clearly touched, and Christian and Victoria both looked happy. As I talked more about our history, I jokingly mentioned how Christian had the hots for me, but that didn't matter because he found his soulmate and that our friendship was stronger than some unrequited feelings. Most of the crowd laughed, and I could even see Christian smiling for a second before seeing Victoria's confused face. After the speech was over, I went over to the bar with a few friends. Christian came up and hugged me, thanking me for the speech. However, at our hotel, one of my other best friends, Devin, female 27, told me she had heard gossip from the bridesmaids that Victoria was really upset with me for bringing up Christian's previous feelings for me at the wedding. Apparently, Victoria genuinely had no issue with Christian's feelings, but felt it was inappropriate to mention them at a wedding. I sincerely intended no harm with my actions, 
maybe I didn't read the room. Everyone I've told is honestly split on whether I'm the bad guy or not, so it's definitely been polarizing. Christian hasn't mentioned any of this to me, and I'm not sure I should ask him. Am I the jerk? Edit. To those of you asking about whether the speech was planned or impromptu, I had asked Christian's parents beforehand if I could give a speech, and they were more than happy with it. People have to stop with the assumptions that this has anything to do with me having feelings, though. Yeah, saying that in my speech was probably an idiot move, but my sincere intention was to tell everyone about our 12 years of friendship and some of its history, and like I said, people were touched up until my fateful joke. Oh, you pulled the, he was into me first card. He was in love with me, but I turned him down, and so now he's into you. Yeah, you're the jerk. How tasteless. I agree. This screams, I should always be the center of attention, intended or not. Also, your crush was such an ego boost that I still revel in it six years after it ended. This is what it was all about. OP can deny it all she wants, but this was not about celebrating years of friendship with her friend, but about stroking her own ego one last time. You'll be forever known as the groom's female friend who said, he was into me first, during a speech at the wedding. There's a time and a place for jokes like that, but a speech at a wedding reception isn't one of them. You're the jerk. Exactly. OP for sure owes the couple an apology, but frankly, the person she humiliated here is herself. All the guests at this wedding will be dining off this story for years to come. The time I went to a wedding and a drunk friend of the groom tried to imply he was her sloppy seconds to the bride is a pretty killer anecdote, likely to elicit many horrified reactions and follow-up questions from its audience. You're the jerk. You don't bring that stuff up at a wedding, joking or not. This speech was supposed to be about Christian and Victoria, not about Christian's past feelings for you. Imagine how uncomfortable you made Victoria feel. I also bet the crowd laughed out of more discomfort for the situation. You need to apologize to the bride and groom. I understand you didn't mean that comment maliciously at all. It was just wildly inappropriate considering the time and place. Not the jerk. This is what the dude gets for sticking around as that guy friend for so long. I know most of you will think I'm crazy for saying this, but I need to speak the truth right quick. Me being a young woman who always keeps it 100. All guy friends are only sticking around because they want to hook up with you. It took years for this to finally click in my head, but once it made sense, everything just clicked. Don't believe me? Text one of your guy friends right now and ask if they want to hook up with you tonight. They will jump at the opportunity because that's the only reason they're into you. Guy friends who we don't hook up with are just emotional sponges and used as an ego boost for our self-esteem. I'm speaking facts right now that y'all will hate me for, but I've talked to many of my homegirls about this, and in private, they will admit that this is 100% true. But of course, in public, they want to act like dude friends are legit interested in them for who they are. It's crazy how we all gotta act fake in real life and deny the truth. Downvote me all you want. I'm in reality keeping it 100, while you over here denying straight facts. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for what she said in her speech or not? Please let us know. This never would have happened if OP would have just kept it 100. Skirt, skirt. Well, I guess in a way she was kind of keeping it 100. It's not like she was lying, right? You know what I mean, Reddit boy. You would have to take that up with the board of directors. There's a huge nationwide electronics retailer in the UK called Curry's. They're renowned for having terrible customer service, but very occasionally having decent prices. I was in the market for a KitchenAid stand mixer and my employer had an arrangement where I could buy Curry's gift cards for a 10% discount. I was a bit reluctant to use them based on past experiences, but thought I would take advantage of saving a bit of cash and ordered my mixer online, delivery due in a week. Easy peasy, I thought. It was about 250 pounds or $300 before discount. Delivery date comes and goes, no mixer. The next day, I ring up customer service and ask what happened. After 20 minutes on hold, they tell me the product is out of stock and I will need to wait for their next delivery in 10 days time. Not too bad, I'm a patient person. 10 days later, still no mixer or order update, even though it's showing as in stock and available to buy on their website. Back on the phone to customer service, more time on hold. This time I'm told there is an order backlog and they couldn't tell me when it would be delivered, so I ask for a refund. Unfortunately, in the UK, if you pay by gift card, you can only get refund by gift card. 
At this point, I had no desire to ever use curries again and was disappointed in myself for ever giving it a go. I would have no use for a gift card, so I decided to give them a bit more time. No prizes for guessing that this didn't bear fruit. A couple of weeks later, I used the customer service online chat to see what's going on. Again, they are completely unable to help or confirm when or if I would receive my order. I asked what I was expected to do and the bloke said something along the lines of, No idea, mate. You would have to take it up with our board. <laughs> Fine. It's malicious compliance time. A quick trip to the company's house website gives me a list of all of their directors, another hour on LinkedIn, and I've tracked them all down. I proceed to send every director a summary of what has happened and links to screenshots of the online chat I had with the CS rep. Less than a day later, I get a call from the CEO's personal assistant apologizing profusely and personally guaranteeing me that she will sort it out. By the time this all happened, the mixer had gone down by another 60 pounds, so she processed my order again and said she would arrange for the accounts team to send me a voucher for the difference. She was genuinely the hero of the story. The very next day, my mixer arrives. Happy days. A few days after that, I get a letter with a Curry's voucher. I thought this would be the end of my sorry saga. However, as icing on the cake, they proceeded to send me three more 60-pound vouchers at random intervals over the next few months. I can only guess that their admin team is as useless as the customer service team. For completeness, I spent the vouchers on a new oven, which unsurprisingly turned up late and faulty and had to be replaced. Some of these stores will do you so wrong. I like to find one good one I can count on and just use them for everything. Threaten my job? Thank you, I will. I posted this elsewhere, but I feel it also fits right in here too. A bit of background. This happened in the UK in about 91 or 92, and I'm female. At the time, I was about 20 or 21. In the early 90s, I had just come back from working overseas, and as it was December, I needed a job quickly, so I took one in a Turkish restaurant. Relevant later. It was a waitress job, and I truly loved the job. The one other waiter was nice. The three chefs were great and taught me a few tips and recipes I still use to this day. The management, husband and wife, seemed okay at first, but typically didn't want to have to do anything except mingle and drink wine during service hours, never once helping, but always quick with blame. A typical night, myself and the other waiter worked our backsides to the bone, and they'd just sit, watch, and pester the customers. I didn't see a single tip when I worked in this restaurant, but it's UK, so not compulsory anyway so I didn't think anything of it at the time. We worked through Christmas and the New Year's Eve shift was approaching, so the manager asked me to purchase some cloth napkins from a store on the other side of town, which I did. I bought them, took them into the restaurant, and I didn't notice until afterwards I was shortchanged in my reimbursement for purchasing them. I had to use my own money. One of the managers said she had had a great idea and she'd like me and the other waiter to wear something in lines of traditional Turkish costume that evening for the booked solid New Year's Eve shift, a shift I was due to start in a few hours. This was the first time she had mentioned anything about this idea of hers. I mentioned it could be possible, but I'd like to see what she had planned. She produced a cardboard box and showed me the first stunning outfit she had chosen for the waiter, my colleague. I said it looked amazing and questioned what she had chosen for me. Bear in mind, I was very slim, about a size 6 to 8, UK, and about 5 foot 10. She produced this see-through outfit that definitely didn't look like something I should be wearing at work. I asked her if she was serious. She said, yes, to which I said, I'm not wearing that. She then told me that I'm wearing it or I'm fired. So I replied with a simple, bye then, and reached for my things. She retracted immediately in a panic, saying, no, no, I didn't mean that. I need you to stay. I smiled and walked out. A few days later, I popped in for my final wages, cash envelope and tax documentation, and the other waiter was there at that time. He said that I'd really left them in a bad spot that night for doing that. I apologized to him, very genuine, to which he smiled broadly and said nothing to be sorry for. The management had to help that night and he even saw some tips. The management were grumpy when they came out to see me and very grudgingly gave me my final wages. I can't remember if they gave me my tax document or not though. The other waiter's reaction to telling me what happened that night still makes me smile to this day. Am I the jerk for removing all the home improvements I made to my room and my parents' house after they announced that I would have to move? 
I, 25 female, lived with my parents, 50 female and 55 male, because it's very close to my service and it's a very expensive area. I can currently live alone, but I didn't because I never needed to and my parents didn't ask. As time went on and I earned more, I put in air conditioning, made my room smart, as well as the house with Alexa, put a very good shower in the guest bathroom, which I eventually added to my bedroom. I bought quality furniture to my room, etc. My room turned out to be the best in the house because of the changes I made. And yes, I paid rent to my parents, quite a bit by the way. It's been three months since they came to talk to me, saying it was time for me to change because they wanted to have their moment alone now and I was able to live on my own. I agreed, after all, I was just living there for ease and convenience. I found a house and I would need to make all the changes I planned, so in order to not have to buy things that I already have, I replaced all the sockets, bulbs, switches, the smart ones, and the shower with common ones. I paid for them all and this increase in energy I paid too. I also removed the air conditioner and paid to plug the holes it left, along with all the furniture in my room and the Alexa scattered around the house. My parents started complaining that I shouldn't take everything out as they were in common use. They were planning to move their room to mine and they didn't want me to take out all the changes I had made to my room. I said that they asked me to move and I'm taking everything I bought because I needed to have other expenses. I made a payment on the house and these items were all bought by me and all the increase in energy I had was paid only by me too and that if they wanted to buy them, I can help them search online, but I would take these items. They called me selfish because I made the house worse and removed the items in common use as they were already used to the smart home. They complained even more when I didn't want to leave the 65 inch smart TV in my room as a gift for them. I didn't leave it because it's new and it was too expensive. I moved a week ago, but they're still upset. All items are brand new, less than a year old. Also, yes, it was cheaper for me to replace. Legally, I can do this. It's not in the US. These things are very expensive in my country. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I don't understand why your parents would expect you to leave stuff that you bought for your convenience. As long as the hole from the AC unit is patched and painted, there should be no issue. This reminds me of the post some time ago of the tenant who turned a bare dirt backyard into a nice garden with plants, greenhouse, a garden shed, etc. And when asked to leave, took it all along, only for the landlords to freak out because the value of the house plummeted because of the backyard. Never gets old. Not the jerk. Your parents wanted to profit from the changes you made. Any chance you could have left it as was or they had paid for new equipment? Sounds like my former flatmate who forced me to leave when I was only away for a few months because she wanted her friend to move in and expected me to leave all of my nice furniture for her at less than half the actual price. I packed and moved everything out across several states. Am I the jerk for saying I didn't sign up for the job of always being a babysitter? My dad met his wife when I was 10. She had two kids. Her daughter was seven and her son was five. Their dad walked out on them and they had not seen him since, where my mom passed when I was eight. My dad and his wife sat me down when they were getting serious and told me her daughter would need me to look out for her because she's special needs and has Down syndrome. They told me I would be her big sister now and it was important I be a good one because she would always have trouble. I told them I didn't want to be a big sister and they said what I wanted wasn't important because it was happening and she would need me more than he would. So ever since that little talk, it has been on my shoulders to make sure she's okay. Kids being mean, I need to help. She doesn't have anyone to hang out with her, I need to do it. I don't want to, I get a lecture. I resent it, I do. I don't resent her, I know it's not her fault, but I never wanted to do any of this stuff. I never signed up to be a babysitter, but especially now, that's what I am. If they want to go anywhere, I have to stay with my stepsister, and she's very attached to me. Like she's clingy and needy with me and I know she loves me a lot. She's more attached to me than she is to her brother or her mom for that matter. She will choose me over her mom in a lot of things. I'm even told to hold her hand when we're out if she doesn't want to hold her mom's hand. I hate all of it. I'm 17 now and the end of my time here is drawing closer and I plan to move out ASAP and not come back home for any weekends or any day visits. My dad's wife is aware of this too. She's heard me make plans and she and my dad have started trying to convince me to stick around. Even worse, they've taken three of my weekends in the last two months and made me babysit her daughter for the entire weekends. 
They're trying to add pressure for me to not just dip from their lives because it would crush my stepsister. This past week, I had enough, and I lost it when it was just me and my dad and his wife at home. They were making plans for next weekend, and I told them I had never signed up for the job of always being a babysitter, and that if they thought I would feel guilty for leaving it all behind, then they were wrong, because I can't wait to leave, and I won't miss any of them when I'm gone. My dad started yelling at me and asking how could I be so cold, and I was a jerk for acting like being part of the family and being part of my little sister's life was a chore. Tension has been present ever since, and I see that my stepsister is really bothered by it. She started crying when she got home that day, and she's cried a lot more since, more than is normal for her, and I'm being blamed. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Kids are not autonomous responsibility modules. It doesn't matter if she loves you. It doesn't matter if they expect it. You deserve a life. You have a great deal to look forward to in your future, and being their auxiliary babysitter isn't it. Frankly? There's help for those who need a caretaker for handicapped individuals, and failing that, it is the parent's responsibility. Not yours, not a kid's, not anyone else's, theirs. They wanted some rose-colored love story, free from tedious responsibility. Forget that. Go live you. Go no contact, and forget them as soon as you can get out. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her dad and his wife? Please let us know. When will parents stop trying to make their kids be parents? How not to recruit a nurse. In nursing school, you have clinical days. The day before clinical, you have to go to the hospital and pick a patient you'll work with the next day. You also have a chance to work as a CNA while in school to gain more experience and make a little money because it's difficult to work full-time and go through nursing school. There were two hospitals in my small town. I worked at Hospital A in the ICU as a CNA. My clinicals were in the larger hospital, Hospital B. I worked a day shift at my hospital and ran over to the other one across town to pick my patient and get my preclinical work done. It was about 30 minutes after 7 when I got there. Most hospital shifts you work are 12 hours, 7 to 7. I knew I was going to be on a med surge floor, so I got on the elevator to ride up and looked through my paperwork to find out what unit I'd be at the next day. A lady in a pantsuit with a hospital badge was already on the elevator and gave me a look like I had peed in her Cheerios. Okay, I just moved to the side and finally found my paper letting me know what floor and unit I needed to go to. In a really ugly tone, the pants suit asked, Where are you headed? Me, staying polite. I'm headed to 3N. She slammed the button and just said, Thank you. As we were riding, she turned to me and started chewing me out. It's not appropriate for you to be coming in 20 minutes after shift change. We've been understaffed all day and those units are slammed right now. I just kind of stared at her for a second and thought, I'm not going to be disturbing the nurses, and if I have to wait on a chart, that's fine. I don't intend on interrupting report, but I just said, okay. If anything, her face got angrier. My floor arrived, and she stepped out with me and kept pace with me as I headed to the nurse's station. I went to the side and took a look at the assignment board to see if anyone had a diagnosis I hadn't worked with before then sat down out of the way and waited quietly because the charge nurses were still discussing assignments. When they finished, I'd ask the charge nurse if there was a patient I should pick. I do this because sometimes there were interesting procedures or I'd get a chance to practice my skills the next day. As I was waiting, pantsuit lady watched me and when she saw me sit down, she immediately snapped her fingers at me and pointed down to the floor and said, You come here. The voice was nasty enough that it stopped several people mid-report to find out what was going on. I stood up and approached her and she grabbed my sleeve and pulled me over closer to the charge nurses. Ignoring me and talking directly to the charge nurses, she proceeded to tell them that I was their aide and she wanted them to make sure I was written up for being late. I realized then that she thought I worked there. I was a lot less confrontational or aggressive then. My, how nursing changes you but I never really got the chance to say anything as she jerked my hand away from me and wiped it like she had just touched doo-doo, looked at me with a face I can only describe as sour lemon smugness and walked away. The charge looked at me and said, we already have an aide, but sure could use you. Let me see how. She trailed off as I held out my hand and said, I don't work here. I'm with my school and I'm here to pick out a patient for clinicals tomorrow. Does that lady always treat people like their dogs? The charge nurse stared at me for a second and then started laughing and said, Stupid jerk, don't mind her, we all hate her. She then asked, 
how much longer do you have? I replied that I graduate in six months. I also asked if they had any interesting procedures or if they had a patient that a one-to-one -one student nurse would make easier to handle. She also asked where I planned on working after I graduated. I just looked down the hallway where the pantsuit had gone and just said, well, not here, which made her laugh even more. I had a truly relaxing clinical the next day with a sweet elderly lady with dementia and a minor medical condition. We folded laundry together to keep her busy and to keep her from pulling at her surgical sites. What was really fun about it is that the next semester when representatives came to try to recruit you to the hospital, I got to reply to a question about why I wasn't interested in their hospital. I got to say that I didn't appreciate the way they treated their staff and tell the story. There was recognition in their eyes when I described the lady and they shook their heads when I told them about the event. Plus, I knew that my hospital was waiting for me to graduate so I could come to work in the ICU, which was my dream at the time. And it was for a bit more pay than the other hospital was offering anyway. My wife got mad, so she changed the locks on our house. I, 30 male, have a beautiful wife who loves to serve others. We bought a home down the street from my family. I have a sweet sister who's 17. She likes to crash at our house with her friends. My wife normally is pretty easygoing until recently. My sister's friends have been leaving a mess, mostly towels on the floor after using our pool. My wife got upset picking up after them every day. I've asked my sister to make sure the house is clean after they leave and it has been better. My wife also complained that some of her perfumes and clothes and personal items have gone missing. My sister said it's not her. I believe my sister. I just don't see her doing that. I told my wife and we agreed to just replace them. Last week, my wife made a couple of pans of cinnamon rolls from scratch. One pan was for us, the second pan was for a coworker's family. My wife went to the gym, I went to work, and my sister and her friends came by. The one pan wasn't enough for her and her friends. They wanted the second pan of cinnamon rolls too, and my sister texted my wife asking if they could eat them. My wife said no. They ate them anyways. My wife got upset and went out and bought new locks. When I came home, my wife handed me a new key and told me that she didn't want anyone else to have a key to our house. I tried to calm her down and tell her that I would just go replace the eaten cinnamon rolls with store-bought ones. My wife decided this was her hill to die on and said no, my sister lost the privilege to come when we're not home. Replacing stolen items wasn't good enough anymore. My mom called and asked if my sister could use the pool as a back-to-school party. I was under the impression my mom would be there. I said yes. My mom was at work and our schedules clashed. The easiest solution was for me to change the locks back so they could just come into the house. My mom didn't come with my sister. When my wife got home after the party, it was a mess. She sent me photos. She called me the jerk for changing the locks without talking to her about it. Keep in mind, she did too then told me I broke her trust. She wasn't safe in her home because she keeps getting robbed and I refused to put an end to it. I did talk to my sister. Then my wife let me know she was staying with a friend for a while. Am I the jerk here? I feel like I've tried to right any wrongs that have happened between my wife and my sister. Update. Sorry, I haven't been able to reply the past couple of hours. I've been busy. I talked to my mom again and let her know my sister isn't allowed over without me home. I asked a friend's wife who is a maid to come clean our home, so if and when my wife comes home, it's clean. The last thing is, my mom asked me to help cover my sister's cheer. She's on track for a scholarship. I told my mom I would pay half if my wife's things were returned. If not, the money was going to replace the stolen items. Also, my sister was invited to homecoming. She wanted me to buy a dress. I told her no for not following our home rules and the money I saved for the dress is going to pay for the maid. I did replace the locks again. I also am planning a romantic dinner I will make and clean up. I heard a lot about the cinnamon rolls. Someone on here gave me the idea to make them. I am for a dessert. Update. My sister and my mom left a few minutes ago. My sister had a bag of my wife's things. More than I thought was gone. Most items are in poor shape. The big thing is, she had my wife's grandmother's ring I thought was in the safe. I had no idea it was gone. My sister said that she found it on my wife's nightstand during the party. She forgot she had it on when she left our home. The ring isn't valuable, it's just sentimental. I told my mom who the ring belonged to, my mom lost it. My sister is now grounded. Last update tonight. My wife is coming home. I'm staying at a friend's house. Until we can work some of this out. I already started it, 
but I did put the locks back on my wife bought. My family doesn't have that key. Your wife has a right to not be stolen from in her own home. Your sister is disrespectful and entitled, and you are the jerk for prioritizing her over your wife's right to literally not be stolen from. If you want to keep your wife, you better change the locks and refuse to give anyone a key. You're also the jerk for thinking store-bought cinnamon rolls are a replacement for homemade. You're the jerk. What's wrong with you? Your freeloading sister and her crew go into your home and eat your food, leave towels on the floor and whatnot, and you're okay with that? Because it's not you who's doing all the cleaning, but it's your wife? Then when your wife has had enough and changes the locks so your freeloading users can't get into your home anymore, she makes the correct decision by changing the locks in the home. And you, the jerk, you change it back so that your younger brat sister can continue her being a jerk. Wow, you are truly something else. You better grow up fast and start choosing your wife over your crappy family or you're going to lose the best thing that ever happened to you. Seriously? You really typed all that out and you still think you're okay? Go get a house with your sister since you care more about wanting to be the cool brother instead of protecting your wife and her property. You're the jerk. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk in this story or not? Please let us know. There's a few things I'd like to say, but I don't think we're allowed to. My daughter treats me like dirt, but demands I pay for her college. I, 38 male, have a 19-year-old daughter, Ariel, with my ex-wife, Lauren, who's 39. We had Ariel too young, and it was a huge struggle. We moved into Lauren's families. I was working multiple jobs. Me and Lauren were best friends through all this, but things ended when Ariel was two. Lauren's friend, Tori, 38, told me that Lauren had been messaging guys, and when they went out, she would give out her number. I checked Lauren's phone, and I found it. I asked for a divorce. Lauren was upset and wanted to reconcile. I didn't and got split custody. Lauren made my life horrible. Lauren badmouthed me, would miss pickup times and make decisions without talking to me. Her dad offered money to relinquish custody. I told him off. Ariel is now 19 and just started college. The deal was me and her mom would split it. I remarried Tori when Ariel was six. Tori was a rock during the divorce, but we didn't date until two years later. Lauren used this to warp Ariel against Tori and our son, who's 13. She excludes them. Whenever she spends the night, she will just talk to me or go to her room if my family was around. Our son walks to the basement if she comes over. It hurts me a lot. I've spent thousands on therapy before people bring that up. It's still being utilized. But at this point, Ariel is being nasty for the sake of it. Her mom has convinced her I cheated with her friend and had a baby, which is funny because as I've pointed out, the timelines don't even match up. I've done everything at this point, including family time, one-on-one, -on -one, and therapy. Ariel is plain rude to them, and they are done trying. Ariel graduated from high school in May and hosted a party. I was invited, but my family wasn't. I told Ariel I found that disrespectful, so I'd send a card but wouldn't be going. She didn't care, and we haven't spoken since. I get a call from Lauren saying she paid the first semester and was wondering when I'd be paying. I said I was no longer paying, as I'm not pulling money out of my household when Ariel is disrespectful to two-thirds of it. My ex went off, saying we had an agreement. I reminded her of when her dad tried to buy my custody and said, You have what you've always wanted, full control and custody. You won, so figure it out. Then texted her that I've been putting up with this long enough. She got her 18 years of child support from me, so until she planned on setting the record straight that I was done with both of them and blocked her. I called Ariel and told her the same, gave her the reasons I'm not paying and told her she needed to look into loans. But I would pay for college if she at least tried to form a bond with my family because she created this situation with her attitude. So if she wants my help, she needs to attempt it. She started crying, but I didn't fall for it. I told her what my expectations were and to let me know what her plan is so I can move the money around. My wife is on my side here, saying we've been the bad guys for long enough, but I'm getting crap from others. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Everyone who is saying OP is the jerk here, you need to get off your high horse and put yourself in his shoes. His daughter treats him like an ATM, all the while disrespecting him. What's worse is she wants him to pay for college with money that will come from both him and his new wife, who she treats like dirt. Like it or not, they are family, and if she refuses to be a part of that family, she has no right to additional support from it. 
She can't have it both ways. He paid child support. He made sure she was taken care of growing up. She's now an adult and has to deal with the consequences of her actions. For everyone who said anything other than not the jerk, you all know you would do the same thing in OP shoes. People like to be morally outraged hypocrites these days, and that crap needs to stop. And to everyone saying he pulled the rug out from under her, seriously people, maybe he made a promise to help her, but that doesn't allow her to act like a jerk. If you're a jerk to people in the real world, they wouldn't help you no matter what you promised. Why is it different for her father? This is her mother's doing, and if her grandfather wanted to buy out his custody of her, then her conniving mother can get him to pay for college. Agreed. It's not his daughter's fault for thinking like this, it's his ex's, but he's not required to pay for her college or anything else when she has zero respect for him or his new family. Edit. I suppose I didn't word this properly. I understand she's 19 now and should be able to do basic maths and realize for herself that OP didn't cheat, but we also don't know what else has been said to make Ariel dislike OP and his wife and his kid. So I guess saying it's not her fault is technically wrong because she's a young adult now and should be able to come to conclusions herself, but manipulation from a young age can really mess with you and warp your brain. Like I said, we don't know what else her mom has said. Don't come at me, because all I want to say is based on what OP wrote. To me, he's not the jerk. I honestly really do feel for the girl. Her mind was warped by her horrid mother to think her father is a bad person. But at the same time, she chose to pick the mother's side and believe the nonsense told to her and let it influence her behavior towards that part of her family. She's an adult and needs to make up her own mind rather than just believing her mother. Besides, OP isn't cutting her off completely. If she wants the money, she just needs to play nice and at least try and be reasonable. I think it's actually potentially a good thing to push for that as it's still giving a chance for her to figure things out for herself. I hope she makes the right choice and tries to reconcile things. It's the mother she needs to get the heck away from after all. She's the toxic one. You left out the part where he waited until the last possible moment to do her out of college. Ariel's behavior is nothing new. OP made his mind a long time ago. He could have told her the moment she graduated from high school, but he didn't. He, a grown man, deliberately did her out of college as an act of vengeance, which puts the entire story into question. You're the jerk. Not for not paying your part of the agreement, but for springing this on them now, so late in the game. Forms for college grants and loans are due in winter for the following year. It's now almost September when classes start and tuition is due. You waited until the very last minute to give your daughter ultimatums, and now, when she's got nowhere else to turn, you threaten her entire college year. That is manipulative, exploitative, and contemptible. Financial aid forms are submitted once a year. If you were a man of your word, you'd pay your share this year as you agreed to and let your daughter know that next year she has to figure out her tuition on her own. But by the comments you're leaving all over the place, I know you probably won't do that. You've decided you're done with your daughter and you don't care one bit what happens to her. You're the jerk. I'm so sick of the her mom poisoned her mind narrative. For her to believe her mother, then you had to have not shown up a lot and been a less than hands-on dad. Because let's be fair, from the start of this post, you make clear she was a mistake and a struggle. I would say everyone sucks here, but considering the fact that your daughter is the same age you were when you had her, and you start the post by talking about mistakes you made when you were her age, that you would understand that youth is not equal to perspective, and maybe not take your frustrations with the situation out on her by damaging her future prospects. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for not paying for his daughter's college or not? Please let us know. When did all these kids start thinking they're entitled to have their college paid for by their parents no matter how they treat them? Am I the jerk for asking my girlfriend to pay for the wine glass she broke? A few days ago, my girlfriend Trish, not her real name, was cleaning the kitchen windows. In the midst of her cleaning, she accidentally knocked over a dish from the drying rack and that dish landed on and shattered an expensive wine glass of mine. I say mine because it was given to me by my mother as a Christmas gift last year. The glass retails for around $120. When she told me she had broken the glass by accident, which she was very nervous about because she knows the glass was expensive, we had a discussion, may classify this as an argument, that lasted three days about how it would get replaced and who would pay. After all of this talking, she finally, she says, gave in and gave me 40% of the cost to replace the glass. I had initially asked that she replace the glass in full, 
but after discussion realized if we are partners, it would be logical to use the 60-40 calculation we use for everything else. Background. Trish and I have been living together for about a year. When we initially decided to move in together, we decided to split all expenses 60-40 because of our combined income distribution. I make 60% of our gross monthly earnings, she makes 40%. After the initial agreement, Trish has now said she does not feel good about the agreement and wants me to give the money back to her. Her reasoning is that A, it was a complete accident, and B, she would never want to buy any wine glass that expensive ever again. My argument is that if we are to live together, we are going to be sharing costs, and inevitably things are going to break and need replacing and repairing. I liked this wine glass, again, which was a gift from my mother, and would like to replace it so that we have a matching set once more. More background. I know for a fact that Trish is financially able to reimburse me the 40% and would suffer no undue hardship from the loss of those funds. On the other hand, I am also fully able to replace the glass without it affecting my financial stability. Am I the jerk for asking Trish to reimburse 40% of the wine glass she broke by accident? Edit. It appears that according to popular sentiment, I am the jerk. I have therefore given Trish back her money. Thank you for the comments that gave gentle and thoughtful wisdom on what you believed might be more of a root cause of this argument. I don't think we've been in a good place for a long time, and asking her for money was never about control. I wanted to see her take personal responsibility, because that is what I would have done. FYI, Trish was with me and signed off on this post before I submitted it. She has read all of the comments. After doing so, we now understand that she does not wish to have such nice things and is worried about being too materialistic as well as a prisoner in her own home, having to walk on eggshells in the fear that she might break something else. She's also sad that I was not able to show compassion and let it slide. I do struggle with showing empathy and compassion sometimes. And I also agree with the people who have commented on the argument spanning three days. It's exhausting for both of us. Life is too short. We have little fights like this all the time, and it's wearing on both of us. It might be time to call it quits. Info why was a $120, presumably delicate, wine glass sitting in or next to a drying rack with regular dishes in the first place? If I had glassware that pricey, it would be washed, dried, and put away after use. Everyone sucks here. You're the jerk. Nickel and diming each other like this does not make for a successful relationship. This was an accident. If she had done this on purpose, I could see asking for reimbursement, but this is how you treat a roommate, not a girlfriend. Frankly, OP, I think you bear some responsibility here. If the glass is that expensive, it should be washed, dried, and put away immediately. Accidents happen, but it wouldn't have happened had it not been left out on the drying pad. I think her paying 40% is the maximum amount she should pay. It's not about the wine glass. She's sick of being nickel and dimed over every little thing. She's already walking on eggshells around you because one wrong step and she's stuck paying $100 since you insist on having stupid expensive junk all over your shared living space. She doesn't want to have to constantly stress about expensive wine glasses or plates or whatever when simple good quality items are just as aesthetically pleasing and more functional. Let me spell it out for you. Living with you is stressful for her. You are ignoring how she prefers to live because on some level you enjoy the control and watching her squirm. For that, you're the jerk. Exactly. I was stressed reading his rules. She was cleaning. She was not being careless. What if it was a guest who dropped the glass? Make them replace it? You're the jerk. When my husband and I moved in together, he washed a very expensive sweater, designer in cashmere, in the washing machine. It was ruined. You know what I did? I cried a bit and then I let it go. I left it in a place that caused him to think he could wash it and he didn't think to check the tag. It was an accident and I treated it as such. I didn't demand he'd buy me a new one, I just got over it. Life moved on and we didn't choose to cause hard feelings in our relationship over an accident. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. $120 wine glass? Then you got us over here washing and reusing our straws. Military revenge from a non-military person. Back in the early 1990s when I was married, we had the beginnings of internet in Brisbane, Australia. My husband, now ex, collected military insignia and he did trades with force members from all over the world. Basically, they posted pictures of what they would trade and others responded with photos of what they would be traded for and receive. Now onto the story. Came home one Friday night after work and hubby was upset. 
After getting the boy settled, I got him to tell me the problem. He had organized a military insignia trade with a US Marine and he had posted his items to the Marine months prior but had received nothing back. Each time he contacted the Marine, he was given conflicting excuses as to why the trade items had not been posted to him and he now thought he was being scammed and would never receive the trade items. This had been going on for months. Now Hubby was scrupulously honest and he was very upset that a fellow military person would scam him. Now being the sort of person I am, I was very angry on his behalf. But what could we do? I mean, the trade person was half a world away in the USA. Well, I also used to watch the TV show JAG every week. I copied every message conversation Hubby and the Marine had had. I saved and sorted them and uploaded them onto a special website I created just for this using HTML code I had taught myself. I pulled an all-nighter and worked from 8 p.m. Friday night until 10 p.m. Saturday night. It was all laid out in spectacular honesty. Then I went and searched this Marine and found his full name, address, rank, and unit, commanding officer, base where he was posted, etc. Basically, every bit of free information I could locate. I put all of this information on the brand new website as well. Then I spent a few hours from 10 p.m. Saturday night to 2 a.m. Sunday morning getting the email address of as many U.S. military bases as I could all over the world. Then at 2 p.m. on Sunday morning, I sent the link to that website to every email address I had found. U.S. Army, Marine, Air Force, JAG, embassies, etc. all over the world. And then I went to bed and slept. Woke up Sunday afternoon to a phone call from a ranking officer in the U.S. Marines. All the items my hubby had sent the Marine for trade were being posted back to him using fastest air freight. All trade items that were agreed upon were also being posted to hubby using fastest air freight. Ranking officer wanted to know how much time went into my website and what hourly rate of pay was I currently on in my administrative job and I told him for him to tell me that that money to the value of my hourly rate times the hours I put into the website would also be heading our way. I stated that once hubby's items were returned, I was more than willing to pull down the website. I respected the military from all countries. I just did not want the marine to be able to scam anyone else like he had tried to do to my hubby. I was told not to worry about the marine. He was being managed by his superiors and we would never hear from him again. Yes, we did receive everything, and quite fast as well for back then. Am I the jerk for not telling my landlord I had bought a house? I'd been renting from a landlord for a few years, and he was pretty typical landlord. Take the rent, do as few repairs as cheap as possible, etc. I'm sure you know the drill. He also was kind of late on stuff. Like every year, the lease says renewal should be sent out two months before the end of the lease to give the option, and every year he procrastinates until the last week or two of the lease. I was looking to buy my first house and I closed on one four months before my lease was up, but I kept some overlap so I could live in the apartment while repairing the house. Two months before the lease was up, like usual, my landlord forgot to send out the renewals. I thought of telling him I wouldn't be renewing, then I remembered that my neighbors who moved had trouble with him bringing way too many potential tenants to tour. Nobody wanted the apartment because the online listing was a bait and switch, so people would see something looking in good repair, then come to tour and see that it was bad. And nobody wanted to sign the lease, so we just kept bringing more and more people instead of making an honest listing at an honest price. So I didn't say anything. I just kept fixing up the house and moving my stuff. Then, one week before my lease expired, my landlord texted me the renewal. I actually didn't see it because I had my phone on Do Not Disturb, but the next morning he kept texting wanting my signed renewal. I told him I didn't plan on renewing and he got really angry, demanding to know what apartment I was moving to next. I got the impression he wanted to call my next landlord to complain about me. Anyway, I told him I was moving back in with my parents. I didn't want to tell him about the house because of the temper he was getting with me. He started showing the apartment right away, but I had already finished moving out, so it didn't bother me. But when I stopped by to turn in my keys and ask for my security deposit, he got angry, saying that I had some nerve asking for $1,300 when I had just done him out of a month's rent by not giving notice. I told him that the security deposit was for damages, and if he wanted to withhold it, he would have to send over an itemized list of damages and receipts for repairs. He gave me the security deposit back, but yelled at me that he took care of his tenants and I was selfish for leaving without notice. I just left but I guess I'm feeling kind of conflicted. 
On one hand, it is literally his job, his only job, to handle leases and find out who's renewing. And if he forgot, that's not really my problem. But I also know that I knew I was leaving for the better part of a year, and I told him with less than a week. Am I the jerk for not telling my landlord I bought a house? Edit. For all of you keyboard lawyers in the comments being like, your lease says, I've read my lease. It doesn't say anything that y'all are saying it says. Have you read my lease? And if so, how the heck did you get into my bedroom desk? Not the jerk. If you want to be a landlord and you expect to earn that passive income, you need to take care of the basics. Not the jerk. He didn't follow the rules of the lease. Since you don't mention any rules about a 30-day notice, that it seems to have to go from lease to lease. That's his bad, not yours. New quality inspector wants it by the book and now has to work unpaid overtime because she's salary. I'll try to make this brief. I was trained in an advanced assembly position to replace a longtime employee who retired last week. I trained for three months, following the man's instructions to the letter, even taking notes on the ways he's developed in order to meet our company's demanding production quotas. Last Monday was my first day officially in the position, and I felt I was doing almost as good of a job as he was. The way it works, everything I build goes into a 24-hour hold. When I come in, I pull them from the hold, clean them, and prepare them for shipping. So last Monday, I start pulling my 24-hour inventory and getting it ready for quality to final inspect before it goes to shipping. Well, we also have a new quality inspector in my department who is apparently really gung-ho about her job. She's salaried, is only supposed to work 8 hours, and has never missed a chance to rub it in our faces because she was also a production employee until two weeks ago when she got promoted. She sees me cleaning the assemblies and proceeds to chew me out because they had only been on hold for 15 hours or so, not 24. I informed her that I was taught that the 24-hour hold was to ensure they hold pressure and that if they hadn't lost pressure in 12 hours, they won't lose pressure in 24. And that by the time I had them all cleaned, they would be out of the 24-hour hold and I would have another batch to assemble and put in hold for the next day. That's how it works. I clean and prepare until my other coworkers have assembled all my sub-assemblies. Then I do the finish assembly while they work on new stuff for the next day. She was adamant she wouldn't touch them until the full 24 hours had passed. So she went and got her supervisor, my supervisor, and the engineering supervisor, who all agreed with me but could see her point. So they told me to start pulling my assemblies out of hold at the 24 hour mark after the day. So I did. And at 3 o'clock, she had between 25 and 30 pieces to inspect every day last week. That's right at 3 hours worth of work and she's supposed to leave at 3.30. However, if she has parts in the inspection area, she has to inspect them and get them to shipping the same day. She can't leave parts overnight. So she was forced to work overtime for free. I've never felt so much anger from one person when they looked at me before. Fast forward to today, my supervisor comes to me and tells me to go back to the system I was using before, that it seemed to flow smoother. I know the real reason though, and that's all that matters. Stalkers think they can scare me out of my new home. Cast, we've got me, we've got Entitled Stalkers 1 and 2, we've got The Kind Neighbor. I should give you guys just a little backstory on how I ended up in this situation. I grew up in Scientology. My parents joined back in 1991 and moved to the States to be involved more than they could from the UK. In 2015, when I was 15, I joined the Sea Org and signed a billion year contract. I know how insane that is, but it was something my parents were pressuring me to do because they thought it would allow me to be the best Scientologist I could be. But last August, I saw my opportunity to leave and I took it. I was sent out with a group of other Sea Org members to confront some people who had been declared as suppressive peoples who were outside the building. When one of them said that they had a permit to film some stuff in the street and since it was public that we couldn't stop them and that it was in the car parked about 5 minutes away from where we were. One of the women I had come out with me told me to go with the guy and check it out, so I did. When we got around the corner, I told the guy I wanted to leave but hadn't been able to because there was always someone watching. He suggested that maybe since we were out of sight, maybe we could get into his car and he would drive me to a hotel and get me to a room so I could plan where I could go after a couple of days. So I took the opportunity and got into his car and finally felt so much freedom that I had never felt before. He also had been a Scientologist 
and had escaped the gold base years ago, so I understood my situation very well. And once I figured out that I wanted to go to Washington, he got in contact with some friends of his who were able to get me there without Scientology having any way of tracing my movements. I have been here ever since. I live in a nice neighborhood, well, at least to where I had been before, and had managed to get a job working in a coffee shop. I've been so happy to be free, but I never fully stopped looking over my shoulder. I know the policies regarding people like me, and I've been keeping an eye out for them ever since I left. Two months ago, I noticed that a car with tinted windows was following me. I knew it was down to Scientology. They had somehow found out where I had moved and were trying to gather information on me. Last week, they finally knocked on my door. Even though I knew it was going to happen sooner or later, I was shaking. My neighbor, who has always been really kind to me, was over. She comes over sometimes just to check on me, and she'll bring me food if she feels like I haven't eaten properly. She's basically been like a mom to me, and I love her for it. I open the door, and things got really uncomfortable really fast. Stalker 1 Your parents have been worried about you, and you're hiding out here. Why? Me. I'm not hiding. I just don't want to be in a cult anymore. Stalker 1, shouting. Liar! You are a criminal. You broke your contract, and you fled. You are evil. Kind neighbor interrupts. Hold on a minute. Stop shouting. OP is not evil, and she is free to live her life as she pleases. Now leave her property, or I will call the police. Stalker 2, holding a camera pointed at my face. You are a suppressive person. You may not set foot in any Scientology building again. If you do, we will have you charged for harassment. I'm confused. But you're the ones who tracked me down. I know the policies. I know I'm a SP. I know about being disconnected with my family. So what do either of us gain from you being here? Kind neighbor. Put the camera down. Stalker 1. No. Kind neighbor closes the door in their faces and goes to close the curtains, as I told her that they would probably try filming through my windows. I went and closed all the other curtains in my home, and after kind neighbor left, I locked my doors too. They're still watching my house from a car across the street, and I feel uncomfortable about going outside. I know what kind of methods they can use when they are fair gaming and SP. I know now, after watching Going Clear and Leia Ramini's show, that my experience with them after leaving is tame, but it's still pretty creepy. Why they feel entitled to follow people around to a point where I'm basically a prisoner in my own home, I don't know, but I wish they would leave me alone. I'm not sure what information they have gathered on me, but I know whatever it is will have been sent back and it will be used against me in some way. But until they try and use it, I have no way to really do anything. If anyone has any advice, please let me know. My wife refuses to help with anything around the house. I, 33 male, am married to Molly, who's 36. We have a son, Theo, who's 5. Molly and I got married 7 years ago, but both decided to focus on our careers before we jumped into anything ultra-responsible, like having kids. I'm a journalist, and she was a midwife, and we both did very well for ourselves. Our combined income meant we could actually survive this economy. Because we were so financially stable, and kind of getting on the older end of the spectrum for having kids, we decided to have our first and only kid, which is Theo, of course. When Theo was born, Molly and I both took time off of work to spend the first few weeks with him, but eventually, my paid break ended and I was forced to go back to my job. Molly did not go back. In fact, Molly did not go back for so long that she was fired. This caused a giant rift between us at the time, but we came to the agreement that she could be a stay-at-home mom while I went back to work. This worked out for a few months until Theo started walking and then Molly stopped doing anything around the house. She would go out with Theo all day and I would inevitably come home to laundry everywhere toys scattered, kitchen a mess, and just no sense of cleanliness at all. I would end up having to clean the house after an 8-hour shift, only to have to work more on reports. This has continued for the whole 5 years of Theo's life. Molly has been terrible at cleaning or taking care of the house at all. She does good with Theo, feeding him, cleaning him, etc., but I'm always left to clean the messes afterwards. At a time, I thought maybe it was too much for her and asked if she wanted to hire a nanny while we both worked but she refused. I've asked her to maybe clean up a little before I come home. She agreed, did it for a time, and then stopped. Yesterday, I had enough. I came home from work only to find Play-Doh all over the living room floor, kitchen ingredients left out on the counters, 
Water spilled over the hallways, toys everywhere, food on the floor. Edit. I feel the need to clarify that I understand kids make messes, but this wasn't just Theo's mess, it was Molly's mess too. It was extra stress, and I finally snapped. I told Molly that I was done with it, and that I wasn't going to clean these messes anymore, that it was practically her job to clean the house, and that she does literally nothing, so this should be easy for her. She snapped back, saying that she takes care of Theo all day, and is teaching him and making him into a good person. Partially a lie, since Theo now goes to school between 9 and 3. She said that kids make messes, and if I can't deal with that, then I shouldn't be a father. That I was horrid to say she does nothing when she takes care of a 5-year-old while I'm away. It stopped after a while because Theo came inside from where he was playing in the garden, but I got told to sleep on the couch. I came back from work half an hour ago and I'm still getting the silent treatment, so I wanted to know if I was in the wrong and if I should apologize. Am I the jerk? Edit. Theo is in his second year of school. He started when he was four and will finish when he's 11. You're the jerk. I've done both, a career mom, now a stay-at-home mom with my own business I built the last two years while working and being the primary parent. It's August, so I'm guessing he just started school. Now, if he's been in school for months, that's different, but a week? She's probably just catching her breath. It's way more work to raise a kid at home than meets the eye. It's exhausting, actually. It's not really feasible for one person to do all of the childcare and all of the home stuff and still have time for their own self-care. You're expecting too much of your wife with a kid. She's raising him. She's good with him. She's making sure he's set up for success. She doesn't do nothing. She's raising your kid. Hire a housekeeper, far less than a nanny. You're the jerk. Just to give you some perspective, I'm a single parent. I work full time. Both of my kids are around your son's age. I spend literally every free second I have cleaning and they completely undo it the moment they get home from school. Case in point, Today I scrubbed the rug and tidied up the whole living room and in the space of me running to the restroom, they had knocked over a jar of pizza sauce and accidentally dumped cheese all over the floor because they were trying to have a pizza picnic. I worked with them to clean it up, but it still looks like I did nothing. In fact, I have relatives who aren't welcome in my home anymore because I got sick of the comments about the mess in my house when all that I do is clean. Five-year-olds are just expert mess makers because they're exploring and interacting with the world. It's possible your wife has the place spotless until just before you get home, but is fed up with the crappy way that you speak to her. You're the jerk. You sound like a complete monster. When will men learn that raising a kid is not as easy as you think it is? Sitting in a comfy office chair all day making jokes with coworkers is 1,000 times easier than raising kids. How dare you come home and throw a fit like that because things don't look perfect. This isn't the 50s anymore, and guys like you need to get over it. Want something to be spotless? Shut up and do it yourself. Don't you ever throw a fit like that with her again just because you're cranky and insecure. Major red flags and way too much marinara. I hope she dumps you and finds a man who knows how to clean things himself and doesn't act like a toddler. But let's be honest, it's 2022, so she probably won't. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his wife? Please let us know. Is a lack of brain cells a requirement to leave comments on Reddit? I think so, Karen. I think so. My husband wants me to put his name on the title of my house. First, some important info. I, 30 female, have been married to my husband, 34 male, for 8 years now. We live in a culture where you never combine your finances after marriage. Some do, but they are the exception to the rule. Also, in the event of a divorce, there's nothing like common property or anything like that. You keep what you bought and anything that has your name on it. We met while we were studying, graduated the same year, have the same primary income. I do some freelance work. We are so in tune in everything except how to spend money, and he likes to travel while I'm a homebody. Since the first day of marriage, I propose that we share the expenses, rent, utilities, groceries, cleaning lady, equally, even though culturally the man is responsible for all of them. Then we should have a savings account to save for a house. He didn't want to save for a house. He said that his money is better spent on experiences. And anyway, there's nothing wrong with renting until we are in our 50s. Then we can buy a house. In the end, we agreed to have a shared account for expenses. Then whatever is left is ours to do with what we want. He tends to take at least two weekend trips with his friends, staying in expensive hotels, going to concerts. Also, even though I cook almost every meal at home, most times he would just order out for lunch or dinner. 
I also go on weekend trips with my friends, but there are more day trips to the beach, hiking in the mountains, scuba diving. Each trip costs less than a tenth of what his trips do. Well, I've been saving for all of these eight years, and now I'm about to close on a small apartment and pay it in full, no interest or monthly payments. The plan is to live there, save what I am used to saving, plus what I used to spend on rent, buy a bigger house and rent this apartment for extra income. And now he wants me to add his name to the deed. I flat out told him no. He didn't want to save. He didn't want to put a cent towards the house. So his name does not go on the deed. I also told him that I plan to buy a bigger house. And now that he doesn't have to pay rent, he can save and put his share towards the next house. Then he can have his name on the deed of the house. Well, he called me a jerk, said that this is not what it meant to be married, and took some days off work to go on a trip to cool off. I don't think I'm a jerk but I also tend to be stubborn when it comes to what I perceive as financial irresponsibility. So, am I the jerk? P.S. I still paid for dates, bought him gifts just because I see something he might like, went on one expensive trip a year with him, usually abroad, etc. I just saved a lot too. Not the jerk at all, and for the love of goodness, do not put his name on the deeds. He put absolutely zero towards it, and you're even offering him rent-free accommodation so he can save towards the bigger house Yet he calls you the jerk? You guys need a proper sit down to discuss finances as this is not acceptable in the slightest. If he wants to blow all his money on experiences, that's fine, but he doesn't get the security of property in return. Not the jerk. We have a saying here. He wants to have his cake and eat it too. Basically, he wants all his expensive trips that he pays for and he wants you to save up and buy him an apartment with no drain on his personal resources. That's a big red flag. Do not put his name on the apartment. If you buy another place and rent this out, then make sure the new place and the rent go to you and only you. Do not let him benefit from your hard work if he isn't willing to share in the efforts. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her husband? Please let us know. We have marital property states here. If you buy a house while you're married, then you get divorced. Your ex is entitled to half of that house, whether they paid for it or not. Am I the jerk for not helping my sister with her IVF? I'm 34, female. My sister, Meg, who's 31, cheated on my ex-brother-in-law, Josh, with his best friend, Liam. They did this for over four years until Josh found out and broke up. Liam and Meg have been officially together for five years. My ex-brother-in-law has been my best friend since elementary school, and my sister knew him through me and despite me saying it would make things uncomfortable, she insisted on hitting on him until he noticed and they started dating. My relationship with Meg took a toll on me because I was annoyed with her for doing this to my best friend, but we never cut contact because of my nephew, her son with Josh, and my godson. One year ago, I received a large amount of money, inheritance, and because I have a good financial condition, I decided that half would go to help my parents and siblings. My parents received 50%, and my siblings, there are four of them, 12.5% each. My parents decided to renovate the house. Two of my brothers paid off their house debts. My other sister asked if she could pay for her IVF treatment with her girlfriend with that money, and I said yes. At no time did I control how they wanted to spend their money. Well, Meg was super happy with my help and talked about paying for her IVF with Liam. Well, Meg was super happy with my help and talked about paying for her IVF with Liam, his infertility, and I hesitated. I'm still best friends with Josh, and I can tell you what they did to him caused years of therapy to get him to start thinking about dating someone. I don't talk to Liam 99% of the time, and I only helped my sister because after all, she had my nephew. I didn't go to the wedding, and I always made it very clear that it wasn't a relationship I would support, but they are free. So I told her that I didn't feel comfortable giving her the money for this as it involves Liam. Her and their relationship specifically, so I'd rather help in some other way. Renovate the house, pay off debts, refurbish the house, and that I would take double care that the money didn't go to that. She started screaming, telling me to get over something that had nothing to do with me and that was years ago, and that I was treating her and my other sister differently because of the past. We argued a lot and I decided to create a fund for my godson that only he could handle at age 18 instead of helping her. Well, this created even more mess because she claims that I helped everyone but her and that I was cruel in denying helping her to have another kid when they can't naturally. I really don't feel comfortable doing this. Am I the jerk? By the way, they didn't receive this inheritance. 
she never received the money. It went to my nephew's fund before she ever received it. Well, I'll put it here. They told me about the plans. I didn't ask, just because they were excited. After I told them at a family dinner about the money, I said, you can renovate your house, pay your debts. And my other sister asked if she could use it for something else, IVF, on another day. So Meg found out and talked to me before I gave her any money. Not the jerk. It's your inheritance money. You get to choose what to do with it. I think setting up a fund for your nephew is a brilliant idea. If she wants another kid so bad, she can go cheat on Liam. Not the jerk. Okay, so you are treating your two sisters differently. So what? One of them didn't put your best friend through the ringer. The money is yours. You could have chosen to keep the money. You could have given it to Josh, an art museum, or the local animal shelter. Meg doesn't have any say in what you do with the money. If she really wants another kid, she should try adoption. To be true, you were placing conditions on her that you didn't on your other siblings. However, given the history, I think it's warranted. It's your money. You don't have to give it to anybody. You don't owe her anything. The fact that you're giving it to her son is more than generous. Not the jerk. You're the jerk. I feel for Josh, and it sucks what your sister did, but if you're giving the inheritance money as a gift to your parents and siblings, you shouldn't be able to dictate what they do with the money. At that point, it's no longer a gift, but almost a bribe. Maybe there's a better word than bribe, but essentially you're telling your sister, hey, you can have this large sum of money, but only if you do what I want you to do. In your post, you offered them options like renovating the house or paying bills, but obviously to them, having a kid is far more important. To me, it feels like you're punishing them on behalf of Josh, but your sister is right. Whatever happened between your sister and Josh is between them. Are you sure you weren't in love with Josh? I understand being a good friend and seeing how hard the situation hit Josh, but you shouldn't be involved or take sides when it's been over five years and you're giving a gift to your sister. That's being petty. May as well not give a gift. Also, what would happen if your sister and Liam adopt? Would you not make a trust fund for the kid because it's Liam's kid, even though they're still your nephew? I kind of doubt it. Well, what do you think? Is OP a jerk for the way she's going about this or not? Please let us know. I don't care. Just come and get all of your stuff. Okay, works for me. A little background. I work for a company that sells and services point-of-sale equipment. We also usually install updated network equipment, run wiring and set up new wireless that has separate networks for both the business and guests if need be. When we go to install this equipment and get the customers set up, we have various documents for them to fill out and sign that range from the fact that they did receive the equipment in working order to whether they wanted a guest network set up and what they wanted it to be called. One of the important areas that we have the customer initial before signing the bottom of the form is that if for any reason they decide to cancel their contract with us, we would remove all of our equipment and they would be responsible to either have someone else there to hook it back up how they wanted it or they could pay us an extra fee to configure everything how they needed it to work without our equipment. So on to the customer of this story. We had just demoed and sold a system to a local health food cafe and I was tasked with getting all of the equipment installed and set up and they did us a favor and didn't open until noon on the day we installed. So when I arrived, I discussed all the things in the document for them to sign and told them if they would like to review it before signing, they could and I would start unloading all the equipment and would answer any questions they had. Like most customers, they skimmed it and then signed. So I installed the registers, credit card readers, got the internet provider to allow our router to take over, installed the wireless system, ran cables for the kitchen printers and the whole nine yards. Even was nice enough to run an extra cable for their manager's computer, like 15 feet away, and reset all of their Nest cameras to work with the new network. A pain, as they had about 10 of them, and you had to scan each one of the cameras with an app and then change each of them to the new network. About one and a half hours just to get that figured out. So needless to say, I did a little extra for no cost as a courtesy. Longer story shorter, they had the system for about one and a half months before one little thing wouldn't work how they wanted. We never said it would. And they got mad and said we just needed to come get their stuff and that the only time we could come get the stuff was either before 6 a.m. or after 7 p.m. when they close. We agreed, but advised them we would have to charge them an after-hour service call because those were well outside our service times. This went back and forth for about a month until they got their next payment for the equipment auto-deducted from their account because they refused to let us come during normal business hours. 
At that point, the call started to get more and more heated until the fabled line in the title happened and they said I could come the next morning and their manager would be there. So the next morning, I arrived at about 8.30 a.m. after their morning rush and found that their manager wasn't even there yet and so I advised the employee what I was there to do and how that would affect them and if they would like to call the manager first to confirm I could wait. I'm not a total monster. They called and confirmed what I was there to do, so I started unplugging our stuff. Router, gone. Wireless network, gone. No more network means no more accessing cameras. Phones are VOIP, so they stopped working. It took all of five minutes to get our stuff out, and I plugged everything back in how it was before. I was lucky enough to not have any customers come in until after I left. Aftermath. They were down for a day and a half on their internet because they refused to call their ISP to get it configured how it used to be, because that was our job. Which it didn't help that they were the type of place that didn't take cash. How gross. Then they called and said we needed to come hook their cameras back up how they were, and started threatening legal action if we didn't. I finally just took a picture of the form they filled out and highlighted the part they initialed and just started ignoring their calls. I think they finally got the hint and stopped calling. Never heard from a lawyer and found out later that half the staff left because of the owner's attitude towards everything and since they started using Square again, their credit card fees went back up. Am I the jerk for not wanting to pay for my wife's spending money? Before the birth of our daughter, my wife and I both worked full-time and low-middle earning jobs, with my wife earning a bit more than I, but not by much. My wife returned to work out of necessity when our daughter was three months old. Her mental health became pretty bad and she has a minor disability that makes work life a little hard and she found it a bit worse after having our daughter, but we had to do what we had to do. My wife's nan, who sort of raised her and was her only family, passed sadly when our daughter was only six months old. My wife inherited everything she owned. It was a big inheritance. Not enough for us both to immediately retire, but a lot. Enough for us to buy a decent house outright, a new car each, and to put some away for a comfortable retirement. Shortly after her nan passed, my wife stopped working and became a stay-at-home mom, partially due to grief and struggles at her job, and a bit because she always would have preferred to have stayed home with our daughter. Thing is though, I'd rather not work and be a stay-at-home dad too, but I've been sucking it up because we still need an income to get by. My wife spoke with me recently about how to budget so we can live off just my income. She'd been dipping into savings to pull her weight, but that's all tied up in investments now. I said if I'm the one who has to work, and I'd rather not, I don't think I should have to spend my money funding her hobbies and spending money. If she chooses not to work, then she can buy clothes at the charity shop instead of new and get a friend to cut her hair for free, etc., or she can get a job working a night shift or start an online business or something to fund her spending money. I don't see why I should have to pay for stuff like her sewing materials and gym membership since I don't benefit from them and they're not my responsibility. I'm happy to pay for stuff for our daughter seeing as she's my responsibility so I don't think I'm being unreasonable here. I work 36 hours a week and I already pay for the bills and food. She said that's not fair if I get to enjoy my gym membership and hobbies like video games but the difference is I'm paying for them with my money. My wife said her inheritance was worth more than if she had spent her whole life working and without that, both of us would be working anyway and having higher expenses from paying a mortgage and car loans. So I should count that as her contribution and share my money with her. Am I the jerk? You're the jerk. You are aware that the inheritance belonged solely to your wife, right? She didn't have to buy you a house, car, or fund your retirement. You're the jerk. Your wife paid for the house you live in and the car you drive, but you won't give her money to buy clothes or get her haircut? Wow, hypocrite much? For your information, your wife is working. She's taking care of your daughter, and I suspect she's doing all the work to cook and clean and run the household too. And did I mention that she gave you a house to live in and a car to drive? Don't be so cheap that you drive off your wife. When she leaves you, she'll take the rest of her inheritance with her along with your daughter. Am I the jerk for not paying for my daughter's honeymoon after she canceled her wedding? My wife and I have three kids, 36, 32, and 25. We've had agreements with all of our kids that we would help pay for up to $10,000 for their weddings or use that same amount towards a down payment on their first home. Both of our oldest kids picked the down payment option. 
They both got married and had medium-sized weddings, both under 100 guests. They paid for the majority of their weddings themselves, but we did pitch in maybe one to $2,000 to each of them to help a bit. My youngest got engaged last year and started planning her wedding, which was scheduled for this October. She told us she would like us to help pay for the wedding instead of a house, since both her and her fiancé are more comfortable with apartment living and don't want to put roots down anywhere since they're both young. She had us put deposits down for a venue, caterer, photographer, and a DJ. These deposits totaled over $5,000 and were non-refundable. About two months ago, my daughter called us to tell us that she and her fiancé had decided to cancel their wedding and get married at a courthouse. She said that the wedding planning was too stressful and they would rather just get married legally and spend the money on a big honeymoon instead. She said that she wants us to take the rest of what we would have paid for the wedding and put it towards their honeymoon instead. She said that they want to take an extra long honeymoon, like two to three months of travel to multiple destinations. I told her that we would not be contributing money to that. I explained that by canceling their wedding, we've lost out on thousands of dollars and gotten nothing out of it due to non-refundable deposits. Mind you, we never questioned any of their choices regarding wedding planning and were not involved in any of the decision making. I literally just wrote checks to vendors. My daughter is upset and accusing me of playing favorites with her older siblings and for punishing her because she wants something different for herself. I told her that the situations are not the same and that giving her thousands of dollars for her to bum around Europe and Asia for a few months was never something I agreed to. My wife wants to give our daughter a few thousand to try and even things out, but I am firmly against this. The way I look at it, we already gave her thousands of dollars and she decided to literally throw all of that money away. I understand wedding planning is stressful and if they want a courthouse wedding, that's their choice, but it also wasn't their money that they lost by canceling the wedding. It was ours. My daughter thinks I'm being a jerk about this and my wife wants to just give her the money to keep the peace, but I feel like that just completely absolves our daughter of what her decisions have cost us. I don't want to pay for her traveling after she cost me thousands of dollars. Not the jerk, but I would encourage you and your wife to inform them that the remaining balance of the money is available to help contribute to a down payment on a home at a future date. This way, you're not playing favorites you are not punishing her for changing her mind about the kind of wedding she wants, and you're still only using the money for purposes you are comfortable contributing to. Note, I get that you are annoyed at the loss of non-refundable deposits, but you are skating perilously close to a jerk rating by framing it as, she decided to literally throw all of that money away. And I wouldn't be surprised at all if that attitude is what your wife is reacting to. You are succumbing to the sunk cost fallacy. That money would have been gone no matter whether your daughter went through with the wedding or not. The only thing different is that, by realizing that she didn't want the big wedding, she has stopped spending additional unnecessary money. No, this is not a sunk cost fallacy. So you know for the future, that is when you continue to put resources in something because you have already invested resources into it. Examples, gambling even more money because you've already lost so much and you have to break even. Trying to fix a lemon because you've already bought it four times over working on it. Not an example, being upset that your daughter betrayed your trust so you refused to make special arrangements for her is not a sunk cost fallacy. She threw it all away, literally. You're the jerk. 10,000 to all of the kids but one. And you judge and come here for reinforcements. I hope your wife throws them the remaining $5,000 because it's fair. So you'd cheerfully write $10,000 worth of checks for a wedding celebration. But when your adult daughter and her fiancé realize that this wasn't what they wanted, which they couldn't have figured out without going through the experience, you're angry because the money was wasted instead of realizing that you just spent $5,000 for her to learn a valuable life lesson. Oh god, we're not even going to finish this comment. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his daughter? Please let us know. Reading comments on Reddit, the number one way to lose faith in humanity. Am I the jerk for walking out on a bachelorette party when I'm the maid of honor? I went to a bachelorette party in Atlantic City. After a four-hour drive, the bride, who we'll call Melissa, could not be bothered to get out of her seat and give me a hug or introduce me to the other girls. No one made any effort to get to know me at dinner. When the bill came, the girls said we had split it evenly, which was unfair to me because I don't drink alcohol, and they all ordered multiple drinks. There were 11 girls, and I didn't want to be the only one who didn't want to split the bill, so I ended up having to pay $65 for my $13 meal. 
then we went to a nightclub. When we got out around 2 a.m., my ears were ringing so much I couldn't sleep that night. Despite not sleeping, I got up early Saturday because we were going to an escape room at noon. I made the entire house breakfast so the girls could eat quickly and we could make it on time, but they overslept and we missed it. Then we got brunch and the ride over was a nightmare. I should mention I was appointed designated driver. Half the girls took an Uber since my car only seats five people and the other half went with me, including Melissa. It was storming in AC and the streets were flooded. I'm talking water up to my thighs. I didn't think my old car would make it. The girls could see what kind of car I drive and decided to complain about how they can't file their taxes jointly with their husbands because their combined income would be over $400,000, all while I chauffeured them. Not only was splitting the bill unfair to me because I don't drink, but since I was driving everyone around, I was the only one paying for gas and parking fees. They insisted on splitting the brunch bill too, so I had to pay $45 for my $15 lunch. After the rain stopped, we went to the boardwalk to do a scavenger hunt. Melissa chose the teams and she didn't even put me on her team. I'm her maid of honor and yet she didn't want to spend that extra time with her best friend. Then the girls wanted to get drinks on the boardwalk where I was again excluded from conversation. I was the only quirky girl amongst sorority types. We were scheduled for a booze cruise with an arrival time of 5.30 p.m. So as it started nearing 5, I said we should get going, but the girls wanted to finish their drinks and we had to scramble to get out of there. Again, half the girls took an Uber and the other half went with me, but we couldn't find my car. Melissa started flipping out about missing the cruise, so the girls took an Uber and ditched me in the parking garage. At this point, I broke down and started sobbing. I drove back to the Airbnb, $450 per person, and packed up my stuff. I left around 9pm and drove through the night. No one texted me to see if I made it home. Melissa hasn't talked to me since. I guess she's mad at me for leaving. Am I the jerk for leaving? Did I overreact? I can't have a pay raise, but my work trip hotel bills are paid for? Okay. My first proper job was around 1990 in London, which is famously one of the more expensive cities in the world. My salary was £1,000 per month, easy to remember. I don't know what the national or London average salary for a young graduate was back then, but I was definitely earning at the low end of the pay spectrum. Especially because it was work that required some quite specialist skills and a lot of discretion. I can't give details without risking of making myself identifiable, but let's just say that the organization was owned by one of the wealthiest men in England, and my task was politically sensitive, as I had access to private information about some very famous public people. The pay was bad, but I enjoyed the work, and one of its big perks was that I had to go to Paris for about one week each month. While I was there, my hotel was paid for automatically, and my meals were reimbursed when I submitted receipts. Anyway, after several months, I felt that I had proven myself to be hardworking, competent, reliable, discreet, etc. So I asked for a raise, explaining that I was finding it hard living in London on my salary. They could not fault my work, but brushed me off with a vague suggestion that maybe we could revisit the question of pay at some unspecified later date. At this time, the place I was living in didn't have a washing machine, which was fine with me, as I didn't want to spend a portion of my meager income on buying one. Plus, there was a laundromat very close by, and I enjoyed reading the newspapers each Sunday morning while my clothes went around and round in soapy circles. Once or twice, though, I had to go to Paris late in the week when I didn't have a lot of clean clothes, so I'd take what clean items I had and get some socks and underwear cleaned by the hotel laundry service after I'd worn them. It soon dawned on me that my bosses never queried the extra expenses of laundry. Maybe the hotel just billed them for the total amount of each of my visits without itemizing the details. I don't know, and I didn't ask. Cue the malicious compliance. Apparently, I couldn't have a pay increase, but I could get laundry done at the hotel in Paris. Okay. For the rest of the time I worked in that job, I used to save up all my dirty clothes, including shirts, trousers, etc., and take it with me from London to Paris to have it laundered there. I felt a bit bad about this, because hotels always charge exorbitant prices for this service, Washing my clothes was maybe costing an extra 20 pounds each trip I made, but I was saving myself 2 pounds at the laundromat. There was never any fallout as such for the laundry issue. After a year, I told them that I had been offered a paid internship in the USA, and they said they would increase my salary if I stayed working for them in London, but I took great pleasure in telling them that their offer was 
too little too late and that I wasn't interested. I won the lottery. Now my mom demands I share my heavenly blessings with my family. I, 23 female, live at home. I finished high school, but I didn't have the marks or the money to go to college. I'm smart. I just spent a lot of my free time helping around the house with my three younger siblings. I got a job at the convenience store by my house full time and I work with my mom at the local dollar store. I give most of my paycheck to my parents to help with the rent and food. I keep $50 a week to spend on myself and I save $100 a month for my future. I also buy scratchers. Not a crazy amount. I don't drink or smoke. I don't really have any bad habits I guess, but I do buy a scratcher every blue moon. My mom says they are a tax on the stupid and against God's word because it's gambling. My dad says if I have money to spend on them, I should be contributing more to the house. My brother is 20 and he has a job, but he doesn't have to contribute because he has a girlfriend and he's saving to pay for their wedding and trailer. I honestly like living at home and seeing my little sister and brother every day. Anyways, I won. Not Powerball money or anything. It's a lottery where you get a certain amount of money every week for 20 years. It's more money every week than I take home in two months. I know people who won sometimes lose it all, but I took my time and did some studying at the library. I went to my bank and they helped me get a lawyer, an accountant, and they have set me up with a financial planner. I was going to keep working and giving my parents the money like I always do, and I like working. But my mom found out I had money for some special treats for my little brother and sister. Nothing big, just a switch and some games. She thought I was wasting my savings and that if I had extra, she could use it better. I don't know why, but I told her that I won the money and now she wants it. It's heavenly bounty and I should give a tithe and offering to the church. I go to church, but I don't think I believe anymore. I haven't for a while. I told her no and she said I had to move out then. So I did. I went to a hotel. My bank put me in contact with a real estate agent and I'm buying an apartment. Just one room, but it's nicer than my house. I'm not working right now because she told everyone. Now everyone is asking for money. But I don't want to give people I barely know money. I've set up an education account for my younger brother and sister and I set aside $5,000 for my savings to give my other brother when he gets married. But my mom is saying she wants to retire and that I'm being selfish. I don't think I am. Am I the jerk? Attacks on the stupid. Against God's word. Give me that. I want to retire. What you've done for your siblings is perfect. Moving out is perfect. Take care of the things you need and want to care about. Your mother's hypocrisy is not your problem or responsibility. Not the jerk. Be careful with the bank, financial planners, and accountants. Trust no one with your money. Double check all the information, accounts, and books. Stick to your plans. You do not owe anyone anything. Create the trusts for your sibling and have a lawyer make it ironclad your mom cannot get it at all. You will be asked for money to fund business ideas and everything else you can think of for your money. Save all you can because soon people may start the lawsuits for every little thing which costs money to defend unless you settle out of court which is what they want. A good lawyer can make them have to pay court costs saving you a lot of money. Just keep your head up and you do not need to donate to anything that you don't feel like. It's your money not your mom's or anyone else's. If you start getting guilted into giving people money, cut them out and move on. Well, what would you do in this situation? Would you give your mom the money she wants or not? Please let us know. Rule number one of having lots of money, never tell anyone you have lots of money. It's always wiser to blend in with those around you than to stick out like a sore thumb and set yourself up to be targeted. Karen and I just might hit a lick on you. Skirt, skirt. Am I the jerk for bringing my sister-in-law's wallet to the restaurant when she conveniently always forgets it? I'm 28, female. My sister-in-law, Amy, who's 26, always comes to visit from out of town. She stays with us instead of a hotel and always wants to go to expensive restaurants. She always conveniently forgets her wallet or comes up with some excuses as to why she can't pay her share. She is implied that since I make much more money than her, I should be the one to pay. No, not my husband should pay, but me specifically. I do make a fair amount of money, but not so much that I can treat someone every time they come into town. Nonetheless, in the past, I've just paid the bill and asked her to pay me back. She never has. She had made a reservation at an extremely expensive restaurant last night, and before we left, I made it clear that I wouldn't be paying her bill. This is where I might be the jerk, and I'll admit I got this move straight from an episode of Two and a Half Men. 
As we were leaving, her and my husband went to the car. I pretended I forgot something and went back inside. I found her wallet sitting right on top of her suitcase. I put it in my purse and we went to the restaurant. When we were done eating, I asked for separate bills. She said, no, we need one bill because she forgot her wallet again. I reached in my purse and said, this wallet? She was extremely furious. She said that I should not have touched or grabbed her wallet. So, am I the jerk for taking her wallet and bringing it to the restaurant? Edit. Amy just called me. She saw this post and she yelled at me for bad-mouthing her on the internet. Honestly, I don't care. Amy, hopefully reading all these comments is a wake-up call for you. Some answers to common questions. Why does my husband keep letting Amy come over? Without getting into too much detail, he has always been expected to pay for nice things for the women in his family. He's also kind of been scammed out of large sums of money by his family. That's slowly been shut down over time, but we're working on shutting down these dinner and outing things too. He allows this because he feels bad that they don't have a lot of money. It's sad, but that's how his family got along for a very long time. Being dishonest about anything and everything to get their hands on some extra money and extra financial help. I could write a book on some of the things I've seen them do over the years. It hasn't been easy to show these people how wrong this is. He has talked to Amy about being cheap, has had come to Jesus talks with her, and genuinely has always felt that each next time would be different. We've been in therapy addressing this, and he's learned to set boundaries. This restaurant thing is a boundary that he hadn't set yet. It's hard to set all boundaries all at once when you actually had no clue what boundaries were and have had no boundaries for years. Does he pay too? We're married. My money is his money. When I mentioned Amy specifies I should pay, I meant more that she specifies since I make good money, we as a whole shouldn't be cheap. What was the point if you ended up paying? I knew Amy wasn't going to pay. She always finds a way not to pay. I went to the restaurant fully expecting to pay the bill. I did this because I saw it on a show and I thought it would be funny to do in real life, to be completely honest. The point wasn't really to get her to pay, it was more to show her that the forgot my wallet excuse was getting old. Is Amy banned from visiting? Fortunately, this post turned out to be a good thing. My husband has always had it in his head that Amy is a good person and has her reasons for being sneaky and cheap, like I mentioned above. In his head, it's not her fault that she is the way she is. It's the circumstances of their upbringing that cause her to make bad decisions. But seeing Amy's reply to my post and people's responses to Amy has really changed his thinking. That's the first time Amy has outright admitted that she's purposely taking advantage. Reading some of the other comments has also been eye-opening for him. So husband told Amy that she's not welcome here, at least not for a long while. Judgment. Thanks for lots of not the jerks, but I liked one commenter's, sometimes it's okay to be the jerk. I think that's exactly what it was here. It was a jerk move, but also outweighed by Amy's being a jerk. Thanks again, this is the end of this. I won't be giving any more updates or comments. Not the jerk, but you totally should have flipped the switch. Left your wallet at home, only brought your license so she had to cover the whole bill, then never take her out to a restaurant again. Not the jerk. That was a boss move. But if you want to keep it up without getting accused of touching her things, when you're in the car, don't let your husband start driving until she shows you that she has her wallet on her. You told her right up front, I'm not paying this time, and she tried to push you into it. Honestly, I don't know why you keep going out with her. Cancel, or insist your husband pays. Like, what does he say about all of this? Because he needs to have a chat with his sister about how she's taking advantage of your generosity. Next time she stays and says there's a reservation, Oh, hey, I hope you guys have a nice time. Yeah, I'm not going. I'm getting tired of you continuously trying to do me over. ETA In regards to OP's edit, Amy, your sister-in-law couldn't badmouth you if you didn't give her plenty of ammo. You're saying she's badmouthing you? She's just telling people what you did. If you feel some kind of way about it, that means you're aware that you done messed up. Stop being mad at other people for reacting to your bad behavior. Change your bad behavior. Grow as a person. Usually, I'm against people touching other people's property, but in this case, well done. Be aware that next time she will be hiding her wallet, but maybe just refuse to go out to dinner if she doesn't bring her wallet or card. Let her know if she doesn't pay, she will not be going out with you and your husband and make it clear that your hospitality is a courtesy, not an obligation. She's very welcome to stay in a hotel next time if she doesn't abide by the rules and respects you. Your husband's family might start harassing you after you establish the rules, so might be worth having a dialogue with your husband 
and having him be the bad cop. If the family complains, tell them that they are welcome to pay your sister-in-law's expenses, including past dinners if you have the receipts or bank statements. I got here late and everyone is saying, you rock, what a power move, awesome idea, etc. This is one of those votes that leaves me hanging my head in despair. You went into someone's deeply personal property. This is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Two wrongs don't make a right. Is there any situation that you would be okay with someone not in your immediate family taking your wallet out with them and then spending your money on something? I will concede that the ongoing behavior of Amy is egregiously awful, but not sure this isn't worse. The only saving grace in my eyes is that more appropriate responses might have been triggering or challenging for your husband to deal with. Everyone sucks here. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Amy? Please let us know. Oh, I can't stand freeloaders. You know what else I can't stand, Reddit boy? People who watch our videos but don't even click the thumbs up. Oh, easy there, Karen. It takes a fair amount of effort to, you know, tap that button with your thumb. Who's going to pay for your daughter's summer camp? We do, with pleasure. I was a girl guides leader for ages 10 through 13, and it was time for the kids to tell us if they would be going on the annual summer camp or not. We needed that info to plan ahead. So one of our weekly meetings, I asked around who would go and who would definitely not. Cora, one of our older ones, told me that nope, she wouldn't go with us. Cora was a determined guide, came to every event, so I was surprised and asked her why. She explained to me that her parents were divorcing and both parents stated that they would not pay and the other one should pay. What I knew, every scouts group here has a fund for the kids whose parents might not be able to pay for summer camp, etc. The kids I was looking after usually had rich parents. Cora's parents were a lawyer and a doctor. The money was not an issue. Pride was. I decided to take them up on that pride. So I went to the chief of the group and told her what was happening. Cora wanted to go to summer camp her parents were fighting about payment. Did we have the funds to finance that trip for her in principle? And I did get the go. So I first called the mother and told her that Cora told me about the situation and that I perfectly understood the conflict. However, Cora was a girl guide to the bones. She wanted to go on the camp and we, the group, would make that possible if they allowed. That we had those funds for the financially challenged ones that I had asked the responsible person and that no matter what, the money for her to go to that camp was there. That I knew finances were not the issue, but that Cora deserved those two weeks and until this conflict was solved, that we didn't care of her background, we'd front that money. We just wanted her to be able to participate because she was a good guide and that we didn't want to take that experience from her. Good news, yay. I hung up, dialed her dad's number and told him the same. At the next week's meeting, I told Cora the good news that no matter what, she could join us. She told me that this wasn't an issue anymore. She had come for sure. Now her parents were fighting over who would be the first one to pay. I pay. No, I pay. Those two words, financially challenged, were the key words that hurt them. I'm not a manipulative person. I could, but I have a strong dislike of it. However, if you tell me that nobody's going to pay for your daughter's summer camp, I'll gladly comply. Gates are open. Please come in. Am I the jerk for wanting my parents in town, but not at my house while I'm adjusting to life with a newborn? I, 24 female, am currently pregnant, due in December. I live with my fiancé, Dan, in the town where I grew up. I have a great relationship with my parents, but they had me quite late in life and they're both retired now, living in a beach town in the south. When they moved out, they sold me the house I grew up in well below market value in exchange for me hosting them when they needed or wanted to come into town. It's been like that for two years. They've been here a bunch of times for three to four days at a time, and it's been a good arrangement, I think. Now, yesterday, I was talking to my mom about the birth, and I brought up that I would like for her to be in town when I give birth and to stay for a few weeks after. Dan has no relationship with his family, and I'm an only child, with only a couple of very elderly aunts and a few cousins I don't have much of a relationship with, so we don't really have much in terms of a support system. Therefore, I'd love for my parents to come here and help around the house, with the baby, offer me the emotional support I know I'm going to need, etc. My mom was excited that I was asking her to do this and said that she'd be okay with staying with us for a few weeks while we adjusted to the baby. I then told her that I didn't mean her staying with us, just in town, as I believe Dan and I are going to need and want alone time to adjust to the baby. My mom was a little offended, saying that she wasn't going to bother us and she was going to help out. But I told her it was nothing personal, 
I just preferred if she got a hotel or Airbnb or something. My father then intervened, having been somewhere within the earshot, and said that accommodation was going to be really expensive around that time of the year. Our town has a very famous big Christmas market, and he wasn't about to spend thousands of dollars when I was asking them to come, and it had been our arrangement when they sold me the house that they could stay whenever they wanted. Which, like, fair, but I don't think that having a newborn at home is just a regular time in someone's life, and it's not like I ever complained about them coming over before. I just don't want them in the house, but I do want to have them in town, and I feel a little sad that they are putting money above me and their grandson. My mother hung up the call, trying to appease the situation, but then sent me a text saying that her and my dad were a little upset over the whole thing and that they thought I was being unreasonable. When Dan got home, I told him all of this and he kind of sided with them, saying that they should be allowed to stay with us, but I still don't think it makes sense as we're going to be needing our alone time. Was I the jerk here? Yep, you're the jerk. You asked them to come. It's not like it was them imposing on you right after you gave birth. You knew before you asked that the arrangement you have with them is that they stay in your home. It's a lot to ask that they come and spend thousands on lodging so they can come help you clean your house and care for your baby. The baby isn't born yet. You have time. Figure out a way that you and your husband can have alone time while still hosting your parents. They sound like good people. Just explain it to them. I would guess husband will be at work at some point over those weeks, so ask them if they would be okay making themselves scarce a few evenings a week so that you, your husband, and baby can have time together. They can go out to dinner together or just retreat to their room after dinner, assuming you have a guest room for them. You're the jerk. Either let them stay at your house or you pay for their hotel, Airbnb, or whatever yourself, or don't expect them to visit. They're doing you a favor. A second favor, since they already sold you their house at well below market value in exchange for you letting them stay there when they visit. I'm not saying you're a jerk for not wanting house guests when you have a new baby. I just think that you can't demand that they visit for an extended period to help you, but insist that they pay their own way. You're the jerk. Look, I'm all for not hosting people right after having a baby. That's totally reasonable. What is unreasonable is to expect your parents to come into town for a month, do chores for you, and foot the bill for a hotel. That's not a visit, it's a maid service. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or her parents? Please let us know. I can't fathom how anyone would expect their parents to spend thousands of dollars on lodging to come visit them for a month. This is crazy. I, I just can't. My coworker took a long break and said she didn't care if I did the same. So I did. Many years ago, I worked at a gas station. It wasn't a big fancy gas station. No, it was a satellite of a grocery store. Nothing more than a tiny kiosk next to a dozen pumps. I have a lot of stories about that place, but only one is really appropriate for this sub. My coworkers ranged from cool to worthless. This story is about one of the worthless ones. Let's call her Sandy. Sandy was fairly new to our kiosk, but not to the job, having transferred over from another gas station in the company. Right out of the gate, this was a problem. She had her way of doing things and we had ours. Naturally, Sandy expected all of her new coworkers to change to suit her, not the other way around. One day it was me and Sandy on the afternoon shift. There were only ever two employees, only enough space for two people in that shack of a gas station, so we covered each other's breaks. Normally, because I'm a team player, I would take my breaks in the little office in the back. If my coworkers needed me, all they had to do was yell. But on that particular Friday, Sandy and I had a problem. She decided to take both of her breaks at once. It wasn't uncommon for us to take a 45 minute break instead of a half and a 15 but it was something we had to clear with our coworkers before doing. It was also against company policy, but we didn't really care about that. An hour before rush hour, the busiest time of the day with the largest concentration of bad customers, she wanted to take her break. That's fine, nothing wrong. I told her I would take my half hour after hers, then we had both run tills for the rush. Half an hour came and went, she didn't come back. Another half hour during which I should have been on break, still not back. Another 15 minutes. She comes in and gets on till. No apologies for taking a long break unannounced or for coming back late from that long break. When I mentioned it, she replied, I don't know why you're getting so upset. All you ever do is sit in the back, and I wouldn't get upset with you if you took a long break. So I told her, I'll hold you to that. Then I walked out. I bought a paper, 
went down the street to Edo, sat down with a big bowl of noodles and veggies, and took my sweet time. All the 9 to fivers on their way home from work were her problem. Exactly 45 minutes after I left, I made darn sure it was to the minute, I walked back into the kiosk. Sandy was not behind the till. My manager was. Apparently, Sandy couldn't handle the situation and started crying. I don't know if it was just me walking out, the workload, or any particular customer that got to her. My manager was called, drove into town, and took over until I came back. Let's call her Tam. Tam wasn't angry with me. Not anymore, at least. She was pretty upset when she showed up to relieve Sandy. Poor girl had to be sent home. But she had found a brief window in which to check the security cameras. It turns out, Sandy told her that she had taken her half-hour break earlier. Then I didn't bother taking mine until the rush because I didn't want to work. Tam decided to check that on the cameras, and by the time I came back, she already knew Sandy was lying to her. I didn't have to say a darn thing in my own defense. Sandy was punished for the long break and the lying, but was not fired. However, on the rare occasion we were scheduled together afterwards, she took her breaks when and for how long I told her to. Good times. Am I the jerk for telling my mom I won't talk to my half-siblings until they can apologize? I, 19 female, lost my dad when I was 6. My mom and him didn't have the best marriage, so she was dating again 6 months after he passed and met her current husband 11 months after his passing. She introduced him to me right away and she did ask me how I felt and wanted to know how I was doing, but nothing I said really made a difference to the pace of their relationship. They started having babies right away and have six kids together, ranging from the age of 11 down to 4. The biggest problem here is with the 11, the 10, and the 9-year-olds. They're kids, so again, I could be a huge jerk, but here goes. Around three years ago, the three half-siblings I mentioned started telling me to call their dad, Dad. That's what it started with. He's not Jim, he's Dad, that kind of thing. I explained to them that he was their dad, but not my dad and I showed them photos of my dad. After a while of that, they told me it was mean to not let him be my dad though, since he was the best one and he wanted to be my dad too. I told them that didn't change who my dad was. I asked them how they would feel if he had passed and mom brought home a new dad. They told me that wouldn't happen and that was wrong or different and all kinds of stuff. I had brought it up to mom and to their dad. Mom told me she talked to them a few times, but they continued coming to me. When we had a virtual graduation party for me last year, my then 10-year-old half-sister, now the 11-year-old, corrected me in front of everyone for saying how I was sad dad had missed this part of my life. She told me that he didn't miss it, he was right here. My mom tried to shush her, but she shut me down a second time. Other stuff has happened in between, and then two months ago, I was briefly home for a week, and during that time, they were going crazy on the correcting me, even had the younger ones copying them, and then... And then they told me that they were glad that he's gone and that he wasn't important and he was dumb. I was dumb for missing him and not adopting their dad. Some of what they said felt very mature and like something someone else had said. But then they just kept repeating over and over that they were glad my dad was gone and it made them happy. I used to call home to talk to them a few times a month and now I haven't. And my mom called to get me to. But I told her I won't talk to them until I get a real apology and until their behavior changes. She told me I need to be an understanding adult about this. I told her no. I told her the fastest way for me to never have anything to do with them again is to hear over a long period of time that they're glad my dad is gone and that he doesn't matter. She told me even then it would be extreme. I told her I don't love them more than my dad and hearing them talk like that about him would fracture our relationship beyond repair. I told her three years of dealing with this stuff for it to get worse is too much. She and her husband called me out for being wrong about this, so I'm here to ask, am I the jerk? ETA, Jim has, over the course of the time that I've known him, tried to get me to call him dad. He pushed it a few times over the years, but would bring it up regularly, but I never wanted to. He will never be my father. I don't ever see the day where I love him either. I've had issues with him because of how often he brought it up and the pushing, but there's no fixing that now. Not the jerk, but your mom and Jeff sure are for not nipping this in the bud when it started. Saying they're just kids only means they'll grow up thinking this kind of harassing is okay. Likely because at least Jim is behind this, and either the mother knows and has done nothing or she's behind it as well. The kids don't come to this conclusion on their own. 
While kids are a lot more switched on than we often give them credit for, this is straight up manipulation from a parent. Given her mother is trying to get OP to be a doormat under the guise of being the adult, she's trying to manipulate OP so the mother can go back to getting what she wants and ignoring OP's emotional needs. All frankly points to the mother being as guilty as Jeff. Air Force Commander makes a dumb policy. We all follow it to the letter out of spite. While I was in the Air Force, we had a commander that was all about looking great to the public and nothing else. He didn't care for morale, personal time, or his troops in any way, shape, or form. In fact, he became our commander as a punishment when he was caught hooking up with a deployed enlisted member's wife. He came from a family of a few two- and three-star generals, and because he got in trouble, he was forced to command our bad squadron with a forced retirement at lieutenant colonel after two years. So basically, he couldn't stand us, and we couldn't stand him the moment we saw each other. We knew how he got in trouble before he got to us, and we didn't take too kindly to it. For context, I was security forces, police, and part of our job is manning the gates and checking IDs for people coming in. There was always a morning rush from everyone coming into work at the same time that would cause traffic to back up. We would do things to try to get the cars moving faster, but no matter what we did, it was always a problem. And of course, it was always the new airman's fault that everyone starts work at the same time, so the gate guards always got yelled at a lot. Well, our fearless commander thought it would be a great idea if we said a prepared speech to everyone when they came in to show how disciplined we are. The speech went as follows. Hello, driver's rank and name. Welcome to installation name, home of the aircraft the installation was known for, and the home of the our squadron name. Your ID will expire on this date. Your vehicle's registration will expire on this date. I authorize you to enter installation. Have a great Air Force day. Obviously, everyone besides the leadership knew this was the dumbest thing ever, but the commander said we have to do it, so we have to do it. The young airmen were complaining about it when we all got on the same page at the same time. We decided that we were going to say the whole speech as slowly and clearly as possible to make sure everyone heard us, and we would do this to every single car with no exception. If the car had a passenger, we would repeat the speech with their information after doing it to the driver. If there was another passenger in the back, we would repeat it again. When our own chain of command would drive through, they would try to stop us from saying it, but we would keep their ID until we were done. Morning traffic went from being two hours long to four hours because of how long it took to get in and created a lunch rush that never existed before. Many times we were yelled at about how long it took. We were making everyone late to work and how much they couldn't stand that speech. So we would tell them this is per our commander's request and his office phone number is public if he would like to talk to him about it. The traffic got so backed up, the local police had to direct traffic outside the base as the line of cars grew to a mile or two long. This lasted three days before the chief of police for the local city and our base commander let our commander know how they really felt about it. When we were told we no longer had to do it, our shift supervisor told us he had never been so proud of us. Having the second highest ranking person on that base tell me to my face, that speech was so dumb, never say that again, as he drove off is the highlight of my Air Force career. Am I the jerk for setting an 11pm curfew on my husband? I know, I know, he's a grown man, but let me explain. We have a 4 month old together, and not once has he helped out beyond changing a diaper maybe once a week. I do all of the cooking, cleaning, and 99% of the baby care has been on me. I've asked him to take an overnight shift before, but he snapped back at me saying, I work, so I need my sleep, so I can put food on the table for you. To be honest, that stung, but I dropped it after that. Anyway, weekdays he works all day and he's so exhausted when he comes home, he only wants to hang out or play games with his brothers and drink beer. I tell him I appreciate him working so I can take care of our son and go to school. I cook, I clean, and I do his laundry so he can just rest. Weekends, he doesn't work, so I feel like he can help out a little more. On top of being a full-time mom, I'm also finishing up my final semester in college. So on weekends, he had agreed to watch the baby for at least an hour so I can submit assignments on time, which is usually the Sunday at 11.59 kind of deal. Or let me take a shower, since the kid is glued to my hip the rest of the day. Hence the 11 p.m. curfew. So I have an hour to do my timed exams, which is just enough time for me to complete. He has yet to respect the agreed upon time for him to come home, so not only can I shower and get schoolwork done, 
We can spend quality time as husband and wife since he's busy all week and goes out every weekend. When he told his brothers and coworkers about his curfew, I was immediately labeled as a controlling, nagging jerk wife, and it hurt. I don't argue with him, and my requests are asked in a calm and collected manner. I have an exam due on Sunday. Can you make some time to help me so I can knock it out? I guess if you're not there, it's easy to assume. Despite that, he won't come home on weekends until 1 or 2 a.m., ignoring my text when I remind him of my timed exams and homework. Then he snaps at me because I don't let him reward himself for working all week. I'm really hurt at the name calling. I pride myself in being laid back, flexible, and understanding. Am I the jerk here? Should I just forget about the curfew? Edit, just so I'm not repeating myself. English is not my first language. I didn't realize until now that the word curfew has a negative meaning behind it. I didn't mean to belittle him. That's on me. Also, thanks for all of the support. I didn't expect that. I'm definitely looking around into finding a good counselor for us. I've already called our insurance and got a list of names. We had a solid marriage before the baby. If we can work it out, I'd like to do that. Until then, I'm looking into a local mom group to get some support until I finish college. Or the counseling works and my husband steps up. Update. So many of you have been so supportive of me and I can't thank you enough for it. Even though you're strangers on Reddit, it means a lot to me to be cheered on to continue my education and caring for my son. For info, my husband wasn't always like this. Eight years together and he always helped me somehow. Chores, encouraging me to change my degree at the age of 24 because I was just miserable, supporting me when my best friend backstabbed me, staying up all night and taking eight days off work when I miscarried for our first so that he could take care of me. You guys helped me realize these red flags and the courage to realize I need to put my foot down. Being laid back isn't going to save our marriage. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.